Hello, everyone. Welcome to the OCP workshop on NVMe, SSD, and EDSFF. Uh, we have an action-packed day today, and a lot of people have worked very, very hard on this event. So I want to take a moment before we get started on our agenda to thank uh, a few people. First of all, I want to thank Ross Denford from Facebook, Emily Pruitt from Microsoft, whose idea this was, and uh, you know, of course, OCP and the staff here supported it. I wanted to thank John Michael Hans from Intel because he's going to be emceeing the event, and you'll be hearing from all three of them later. I also wanted to call out a few people, a few organizations that have helped to make this event possible. Um, this event uh, would not be possible without our four sponsors, Facebook, Intel, Keoxia, and SK Hynix. And of course, our sister organizations, NIA and NVM Express. So again, we're a collaborative community. We rely heavily on our members, on our, on our attendees and folks like you but we also rely heavily on our sponsors and sister organizations to really help us make this happen. Behind the scenes, I wanted to thank Michael Schill and Kaylee Burdett for all of their support. Uh, you can't see them, but they're there managing the event, uh, managing uh, all the webinar and the logistics uh, behind uh, the scenes. So again, a lot of people went uh, and made this possible and did a lot of uh, back, uh, back of the scenes work to make this happen. So thank you so much again. Um, so with that, let's begin. Action-packed agenda. We've got analysts that will be talking to you. We've got companies that will be talking to you about the State of the Union on EDSFF and on NVMe. We've got hyperscalers that will be sharing their perspectives. We've got storage companies that will be talking about their products that are based on NVMe. 1.0, the spec that was contributed by Microsoft and Facebook. And then we've also got some independent uh, hardware and software companies that will be talking about testing validation infrastructure around this. So sit back, relax for the next two hours. Um, uh, you know, share your thoughts, put your comments and questions in the chat. I'm sure the presenters and uh, others would like to hear from you. We want to make this an interactive experience. Um, we've got 22 presenters, so a lot to capture in these next two hours. And uh, we appreciate your patience. And again, thank you so much for your support. Um, let's get started. John? Awesome. Hey, good morning, guys. Uh, I'm John Michael Hans. I'm a product manager here at Intel for our data center and SSDs. Uh, I co-chair the NVMe Express Marketing Work Group with Cameron, who's also on the call today. I also co-chair the SNEA SSD Special Interest Group. So we actually own all the marketing of all things EDSFF and everything else SSD related. So if you've read the uh, Form Factors page on SNEA, that was that was us. Um, and I'm also a contributor to the OCP Storage Work Group. So uh, we did an OCP Tech Week um, the, back uh, earlier last year, and we had a lot of good sessions on EDSFF. And, we just get a ton of questions. Um, actually, that SNEA YouTube video that we have for EDSFF was actually one of the most viewed uh, YouTubes on the, on the SNEA channel. So obviously, a lot of people are really interested in form factors and uh, NVMe SSDs. So the way we're going to break it down today is uh, we have some industry analysts. Jeff Janukowicz from IDC is going to give us an overview of the EDSFF market, SSDs versus hard drives, all kinds of interesting market data. We have a special guest, Patrick from Serve the Home, who's going to give us uh, his, his take on this uh, you get Spef and NVMe SSDs. Um, Anthony Constantine from Intel is going to lead us through a State of the Union for uh, where we're at with the actual you get Spef specifications. Uh, and then Lee Pruitt is going to do the same for the OCP and NVMe SSD spec. And then we have a host of guests uh, to go through awesome uh, new cool systems and servers around you get Spef and NVMe uh, for hyperscale data centers to OEM servers and enterprise storage. Uh, and then we have all the SSD vendors, including myself, going to uh, preview with lots of new products. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Jeff to get the uh, IDC one started. Jeff, welcome. Why don't you introduce yourself? Great. Thank you so much, John Michael. Um, really great uh, lineup I think we have here today for everyone. And good day, everyone. Um, and thank you. I, I truly appreciate the opportunity, um, as John Michael talked about, really to share with you uh, some of our thoughts uh, and perspectives around the SSD market. 
Um, before I get started, uh, I did want to thank OCP, obviously, for putting this together. Um, clearly a, a great agenda. Uh, as you heard, uh, my name is Jeff Janukowicz, uh, and I work for IDC, uh, leading market research fun, uh, company. Uh, and I manage IDC's coverage around storage and memory. Uh, and really in that capacity, I spend the bulk of my time looking at the SSD market, which is what I've been doing for the last 14 years or so. Um, and what I'd like to do today uh, in my brief time uh, is to hopefully give you some perspective around the state of the SSD market in 2021, uh, and specifically around data center NVMe drives, and really how we see that evolving not only today, but really over the next couple of years, at a lot, as a lot of these initiatives that you know, I think John Michael just touched upon start to become into fruition. So if we can move to the next slide. Now, 2020 was clearly an unprecedented year due to the COVID-19 pandemic and really the repercussions that that caused throughout the world and on public health. But it also caused an impact on the IT industry. And if we look back, the IT industry really performed much better than originally expected. And in fact, what we saw is actually an acceleration of many digital transformation efforts from both businesses as well as consumers. And if you look here at the chart for SSDs, as you can see a long history here, but it also accelerated spending that we're seeing on solid state storage in the enterprise. And in fact, last year, marked a key inflection point for the industry where spending on enterprise SSDs now outpaces that of enterprise hard drives. Now, obviously this is a little bit of a historical view, but clearly an important one. And the industry has really come a long way to make this transition happen. But, and John Michael, if we can move to the next slide. Now, if we do start to look forward, we continue to see SSDs expanding their presence in the overall enterprise and data center market. In fact, IDC expects SSD capacity to grow at a 43% compound annual growth rate and move from today, where we're around 12% of the overall capacity that ships annually, uh, to more than 17% of the total exabytes that ship by the end of our forecast period. And while this is a great chart, I think the question, at least when we talk to folks, is really how do we go from where we are today to that 17% as we see in the future? And clearly something like pricing is obviously going to be a key factor in our opinion that's going to drive a lot of that elasticity of demand that's going to help SSDs to become more prevalent throughout the enterprise market. But what I'd like to share with you is, is, is that we think it's actually really much more than that that's going to help move the SSD industry moving forward. And if we move to the next slide. And what I really mean by that is it's really going to be about optimizing the ecosystem for solid state storage to unleash the full potential of the technology. And as we heard from the agenda, we see many vendors really with the help of OCP really trying to do this today. And in our opinion, what this means, it means adjusting both power and performance levels to suit the overall environment. It means developing different endurance ranges and products to satisfy read intensive versus write intensive workloads. It also means moving away from some of these legacy interfaces like SATA and SAS towards NVMe. Taking advantage of SSD's flexible form factors through some of these initiatives and optimizing for different uh, IT infrastructure architectures is also going to be critical. And it even means adjusting software as well as the overall operating system to become more flash aware. Now, if we move to the next slide, you can see here, if we just look at interface transitions, we can clearly see that movement away from those legacy interfaces that I touched upon and new interfaces like NVMe that are obviously optimized and created from the ground up around solid state storage media are clearly the future. Now, this does not mean that the other interfaces are going to go away in our opinion, but today, if you look, NVMe has already moved into the mainstream. And as we look forward, NVMe is clearly the future in the data center market. And this really does highlight just one clear example of the need to optimize to support the overall modern data center. But if we move to the next slide, 
we're also seeing a lot more segmentation. And we are seeing some segmentation within the overall NVMe market that's gonna further help optimize the technology for different workloads, but also different use cases. And this can range from anything from high performance and mixed workload environments to others focus on IOPS or IOPS scaling and read bandwidth, but also very important characteristics like power and cost. And here, if you look at the chart, you can see our view of data center NVMe unit shipments versus enterprise class NVMe shipments. Clearly, you know, we see data center NVMe growth outpacing the overall market. And lots of this is really driven by the cloud and hyperscale markets, but it's really gonna permeate, in our opinion, throughout the overall entire market. If we move to the next slide. Really one of the other key areas that we're seeing, as you heard in the agenda, is around some of the, the evolution of enterprise SSD form factors. Now, when SSDs first got started, it was much easier to leverage a two and a half inch form factor since those were the available slots that we saw in most of the servers and storage systems. However, as we look to further optimize, clearly taking advantage of the flexibility that SSDs can provide in terms of various options for length, width, and height is really gonna be the next area that we're gonna see the industry as well as OCP focus some of their efforts. And specifically what I mean by that, and you could see a few examples of that here on the chart, some of the newer form factors like EDSFF, specifically E1 long and the E1 short form factors. Now, I don't have any quantitative data to share with you around some of these form factors in this deck, but I did wanna let you know in our upcoming forecast that's hopefully gonna be released sometime next month, we will be providing some additional breakouts uh, around some of these new variations in a lot more depth. And as you heard in, through the agenda, I'm sure we're gonna hear a lot more about both NVMe, but also the new EDSFF form factors through the course of today's workshop and through some of the rest of the presentations. So if we can move to the, my last slide, uh, again, I was gonna be relatively brief, but to wrap this up, I wanted to give you maybe just a few quick high-level takeaways uh, for you to think about through the course of uh, the rest of today's uh, workshop. And when we step back and think about SSDs, clearly we think the, we've entered into a new era in the enterprise market with solid state storage at the forefront of today's modern data centers. And that's really helping drive digital transformation across the overall industry. When we look at NVMe, today NVMe has already moved into the mainstream as I shared with you. And when we look at some of the newer versions and we see some of that sub-segmentation sub specifically around data center NVMe, clearly we're seeing that's an area where it's gonna outpace the overall market growth. And then lastly, when we think about optimizing the overall IT infrastructure, optimizing for solid state to be more efficient, flexible and scalable is really gonna be one of the key factors in our opinion to drive the future of digital infrastructure for the overall industry. So with that, my last slide, just wanted to thank you once again. Um, and if you do have some questions, as you heard, we will have a Q and A a little earlier or a little later, uh, but also if you do need more information, please feel free to reach out. Uh, and I look forward to the rest of the workshop and John Michael, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. Yeah, Jeff, thanks a lot. I, I know it's funny in that form factor slide, I, I had a customer meeting yesterday and they're like, can't everybody just agree on one form factor? <laughs> I just laughed, I'm like, I, I wish, but uh, you know, we actually have, when we get into some of the EDSF uh, overviews in the afternoon, you, it'll be very clear why so many different form factors exist and they're part of the same family and there's a lot of synergy between them. And that that's something that's missed on a lot of people, but, um, they're all so segment specific and optimized for the different use cases. And, and we're gonna go in deep dive into the, you know, why that is. Uh, so Jeff, thanks again. Uh, I'm an avid reader of the reports. Uh, <laughs> so much appreciated. Um, so we have a special guest. Patrick, why don't you come on? <laughs> welcome, and I'm also a fan of Patrick's channel. So welcome Patrick, why don't you introduce yourself? 
Hey everyone, I'm Patrick Kennedy. I'm editor in chief at Serve the Home. Um, and today I'm gonna share a little bit about a media perspective on some of the next generation form factors for SSDs. And if anybody like John Michael watches the YouTube channel is wondering what the heck this camera view is, we're having a little issue with the main cinema camera today. So um, this is what we are. So maybe we can just kind of move to the next slide. Just give a quick overview for anybody that doesn't know Serve the Home. Um, you may wonder why the site is called Serve the Home, yet we are basically the largest server storage and networking review site out there. Um, originally, the idea was that we were talking about the home directory in Linux, and that was a bad decision, probably in terms of naming that we made in June of 2009. But about 12 years later, it's not going to change. Um, you know, we use we do our data center reviews, actually hands-on reviews in data centers. We have three facilities that we use in the Silicon Valley, so we actually do a about 60 to 70% of our coverage is hands-on reviews of hardware. Um, and we've been covering OCP since uh, back in the days when the OCP summit was a couple folks in the Santa Clara Convention Center. Um, so for quite a while now. Um, and then, you know, just in terms of readership, I guess our you know key readers are really IT admins, programmers. We have folks that do IT procurement and we have uh, what I call server enthusiasts, uh, folks that just like to keep up on the industry um, no matter what, I guess, their job role or job function is. Uh, big things about STH, and I don't really talk about this publicly too much, it's probably the first time I've ever kind of shown this, but really one of the main goals that we have is to show folks these server storage and networking gear in terms of you know two different formats. Really the web kind of reading format, which is more of the traditional format, but we've also been growing our video format in terms of our YouTube channel over the last few years. And part of our big goal is to have not just the ability to create content around you know, reviews and getting people uh, to be able to see both in both formats, but also to distribute those formats to a large number of folks. So STH content reaches millions of people a year, a year and that basically gives us a pretty nice um, Cross section and a lot of feedback in terms of what people are reading. We get to we get to hear a lot of different perspectives from our readers. So if we go to the next slide, um, you know, big things I want to cover today are really just some of the insights that we get in terms of you know what we hear as feedback from our readers, and then also talking a little bit about some of the you know marketing perspective in terms of overcoming adoption barriers to some of the new form factors, and then just kind of a couple quick closing thoughts. I'm gonna pop to the next slide real quick. So we've actually been covering ruler form factor SSDs since 2017. And we've been covering them in a number of different ways. So we covered, I think, the original Intel Ruler SSD uh, announcement back at a uh, at a storage summit a little while ago. But we've also done things like I visited WeWin in Taiwan and looked at their labs where they're creating some of the next generation servers using new form factors for some of the big hyperscalers. I've done. Uh, Inspire Intelligent factory tours in Jinan, China, where I went and saw some of the cloud servers in China get made. Um, you know, we've covered a number of the different announcements through the years of different form factors. But the key thing here is really that I think that our readers, at least, and I think a lot of the industry has heard that there is a change coming in the market, that we are moving away from 2.5 inch to something different. And you know, I think that's also, uh, I think it's good from an education standpoint, but I also think it presents some challenges. So if we go to the next slide real quick. Um, you know, I, I, I did a little bit of research uh, when I was asked to do this presentation a couple of days ago, and really just kind of looking back at the comments that we've gotten on our articles, and also just taking a look at you know, some of the emails, we, we on the STH main site in the written format, people tend not to like, like to write comments, they tend to send emails if they have questions. And so I went through just an exercise of kind of categorizing the different types of questions that I've gotten. And I found about 912 emails on, uh, sorry, emails and comments that were on the various ruler SSD articles and coverage. And I basically summarized those into a couple of different buckets. And you can see that actually we have a couple of folks that are really kind of looking at, you know, where can I go buy? But the big questions are really pointing to the fact that we're very early in the cycle, right? Standards are still, um, you know, I would say developing. 
And so folks are still uncertain in terms of the scope. And also because we've been covering things for five plus years and there have been different competing form factors, there has been some uncertainty in terms of who's a winner and you know, who's gonna be adopting what type of specification. So this is something that you know, really, I don't think is um, necessarily the, the highest degree of confidence in terms of, you know, I may have missed one when I was, I was ticking them off, but I think it just shows the directional uh, insights in terms of what our readers are asking in terms of next generation SSD form factors. All right, next slide. Um, one of the cool things though, that I did look at on our coverage, and I really look at our coverage in a couple different ways. Um, we tend to do a lot of hands-on review pieces, which people look at, you know, initially when we come out with a piece, but then also when they're in their purchasing cycle, they go and they'll, you know, look up an STH review and look at different options in terms of items that we've reviewed or products that we reviewed on the site. But one of the things that you also see is that there's a different type of content that we do, which is kind of more of a product launch or some type of article. And those tend to have a lot of readership over the first 72 hours, but then a lot lower of a tail readership. Um, when we do things on next generation SSD form factors, so we tend to see a couple of trends. One, people spend a lot more time on those articles. Uh, just when we look at, at the metrics, people spend a lot more time reading those articles. So I think that's actually kind of interesting that just in terms of um, you know, engagement, folks are on pages longer. The other thing is that we tend to get more page views in the first 72 hours, so during that initial release cycle, uh, if we do a next generation form factor piece. And then also when we looked at some of the pieces that we've done over the last couple of years and compared them to some of the other articles that we've published, um, you actually notice that we, what I call the long tail, so outside of that, you know, really we use it after, actually, actually after the next quarter, um, but after that next quarter, people actually are coming to those articles more often than they do other articles that we publish. It's not a huge number, but it is, it is measurable. And then uh, we did a hands-on piece with a Supermicro uh, 1U EDSFF form factor system last summer, just as uh, some of the COVID restrictions lifted and we were able to do some uh, video over at Supermicro with masks on. And that one at the for a video at the time actually has performed very well. Um, the STH YouTube channel, we basically really started pushing uh, in early 2021. Um, so we're more than twice as big as we were back then, but you can kind of see that over the first couple of days and, and over time that that video has performed well. So I think the big key takeaway there is that people are definitely interested and they are engaging with this type of content on STH, which means that they tend to have a lot of interest in a topic. Um, if we can go to the next slide, that'd be awesome. And so one of the big things that we definitely get a lot of comments on, I think this is something that I just wanted to, I guess, make an ask of the participants today in terms of thinking about is really just, you know, this, this is a big theme that we've seen in a lot of the questions that we get is really just the fact that two and a half inch SSDs are really seen as kind of a safe choice in the industry. And that's because, well, you can have an NVMe SSD, you can have a SAS SATA SSD, and you can also have a hard drive. The interesting thing about that is that, you know, the next generation SSDs are really designed to take advantage of the, I guess, newer form factors that are enabled by NAND uh, designs, right? And also being able to take advantage of things like better thermals and all of that kind of stuff. But I think that the, we'll, there will be a point that outside of the hyperscale community, we're going to have to get over this idea of, you know, two and a half inch, well, I should, I should, you know, get a two and a half inch drive because I could still potentially put a you know two and a half inch hard drive in that same slot in my server chassis it seems kind of to a lot of people that i think uh, work with hiring gear this kind of seems a little bit um archaic but i will say that a top three server vendor is actually asking us to review a new server with two 15k two and a half inch rpm as a or hard drives in it um and that's systems probably gonna arrive later this week. So uh, it's definitely definitely something that the industry even though i think a lot of folks are still thinking SSDs are the way forward and are really the modern infrastructure. There are a lot of folks that have hesitancy because that two and a half inch form factor has been with us for so long. We can go to the next slide. Um, the other thing I think is really, and th this is, I don't mean to say to, uh, I guess, point out Intel slide here, but this is one of the original Intel ruler uh, SSD slides, and it was really talking about the efficient thermal design and why moving to a ruler type form factor is better from a thermal perspective than the current 
U dot to two and a half inch form factor. And you know, I think when we were talking about SSDs to hard drives in two and a half inch, we could talk about higher reliability, lower latency, higher throughput. But and, and those are all metrics that I think matter to a lot of IT buyers. But you know, the idea of why does a buyer even care about uh, thermal design? It, it's kind of a different order of a uh, benefit that I think that we'd be showing people for saying like, hey, the reason we need to go move to these new generations of form factors is really because of thermal design. So I think that one of the key things that we need to think about as a industry is how to offer that, you know, there are benefits well beyond uh, things like the thermal design of an SSD. So if we can move to the next slide, that'd be great. Um, the other big key, I guess, key trend that we're seeing in our coverage and how people are engaging with our coverage is really that there are a there is a divergence in the industry in terms of looking at data center densities. Um, as power consumption rises, you know, not just with this generation, but then into the next generations, what you're starting to see is that there's becoming a classification of data center customers where you're seeing that you know the hyperscale folks, I think they all have plans for higher power consumption and higher densities, but there are a lot of folks in you know the US that have 208 volt, 30 amp racks that can only fit so much hardware. And so driving more density in terms of systems doesn't necessarily really gain them any large benefit. And this is a Dell PowerEdge XE 8545, which that system alone in either configuration basically will use enough power that in that 30 amp to a volt rack you can only put one of them and run it at full load you can't put a second one and so that's a good example of where i think we're going to start seeing a bifurcation in terms of needs in the industry for folks that need that high density versus you know folks that can't take advantage of that high density and that was when we you know, if we talk about that super micro one u half petabyte uh, storage server, I think that's a really good example of where, hey, you know, there are certain sets of folks that said, this is great, I can get better density by packing that much storage into one U. But there are other folks that look at that and say, well, my issue is not my storage density. I, I really, you know, that, that's going to use too much power. I can't really use that much storage density. So, you know, for if we have one deep learning box in Iraq, I can pretty much throw another uh, another storage node in there or two. And if that's to you instead of one you, I don't really care. And so I think that that's also part of the marketing story that we need to tell, which is why these form factors have benefits other than just the extreme density. We can go to the next slide, that'd be great. All right, so I guess it just in closing, uh, you know, I think the big key takeaways here are that there is a lot of interest in our coverage. Um, you know, we get to see coverage and, and we get to see, I guess, interest based on, we get millions of folks coming to STH and we get to see, you know, what they're looking at. Um, so I, I definitely think that there is a lot of interest in next generation form factors. And I think that now that the standards are really being, uh, I guess, defined and driven, and I think some of the format, um, divergences of opinion uh, are kind of coming to rest and, and people are aligning. I think that that's a good opportunity to get some of the really good messaging in the industry, explaining to buyers outside of some of the largest uh, SSD buyers why these new generation form factors are important. And I think that, um, you know, one of the other things that I would challenge this group for is really thinking about what the art of possible. If you, if you look at why people buy SSDs you know, they're really looking at performance, capacity, and also features. And I think that, you know, a new form factor like this has the ability to not just run SSDs, but also has the ability to run other devices like AI accelerators um, and what have you that are PCIe connected devices. And so having a message around why we're changing from the two and a half inch form factor that is kind of like that comfort blanket of being able to also put a hard drive in, I think that one of the kind of cool features or one of the kind of cool things that we could do as an industry is really talk about what's the art of possible, what else could we put in those slots, and why that could be impactful for infrastructure of the future. So with that, um, through my slides, I guess. Uh, it's fantastic, Patrick. Uh, I'm good to see that ruler slide I made in 2017 is still getting some airtime. <laughs> you, I was the product manager for, for that. Um, yeah, no, um, Patrick, and I couldn't agree more. I think on your site, you say stuff about, you know, being the end of SATA and be excited that that's close. And I think you'll hear it today. I think all of us from the SSD vendors and everybody in the industry is, is ready for that era to end. And we've got so much better products and they're, and they're here. Um, 
And you, you also hear, I think, from the, the vendors this afternoon, uh, E1.S is not going to be just a small fad or just another niche use case. This is going to be the next generation of NVMe SSD form factors. And it will see use in enterprise. It'll see use in cloud. And I'm really hoping it gets down and trickles down to the enthusiast and desktop and high-end. Because I, I just really like it. It's a really cool form factor. So we'll see. <laughs> I'm holding my I agree. breath. Awesome. Yeah, Patrick, thanks again. Uh, really appreciate coming on and sharing your thoughts. Again, really enjoy the channel. And I, for anybody who hasn't watched Patrick's channel, check it out on YouTube. Lots of very good reviews of most of your guys' products <laughs> here. All right, thank you so much. Thanks, Pat. Okay, uh, well, thanks, guys. That was awesome. Um, the next one we're going to do is uh, Mr. Anthony Constantine, who's my, my dear friend from Intel, is going to share uh, the State of the Union on EDSFF uh, the actual specifications. Uh, I know we kind of did this backwards. I'm going to give a, uh, um, what, what I'm going to do is give an overview of EDSF, kind of a quick introduction kind of later this afternoon, um, just before we do the SSDs to kind of recap on for anybody who needs that kind of intro. I was hoping that everybody watched that SNEA video where we have a, a pretty long format of like introduction to all the EDSF form factors. But Mr. Anthony, is uh, our representative into the SNEA SFF work group who actually does all the hard work of actually creating the specs. I just read them and uh, make products based on them. So <laughs> Anthony, without further ado. I'm not the only one that does the hard work. Everyone else on this, or a lot of the uh, presenters on this call spend a lot of time uh, working on these specifications. So in any case, thanks JM for the introduction. Um, as he said, my name is Anthony Constantine. I'm a principal engineer at Intel. And one of my key responsibilities is the DSFF specifications. So jumping into it, um, I kind of, what is EDSFF? I've kind of gone through this probably over the last few years because I think this has been about a four-year journey now. Um, but really, EDSFF is a series of specifications originally meant for um, multiple SSD usages. Um, during the development of the specification, we were focused on key areas of improving the SSD design uh, while balancing the needs of both the uh, host and device. Um, what we've come to found is over time, um, we believe these usages are growing beyond the SSD. We we hit something um, as far as uh, doing during the development that, hey, this could also be used in some of these use cases like um, um, Patrick previously mentioned, like uh, looking at um, uh, low power um, inference or um, even potentially memory devices. Um, so really, we're seeing the usages growing beyond the SSD. Um, but in that, there are multiple usages, and that drives multiple form factors. Um, there are multiple servers out there right now. You've got compute and storage and general purpose, disaggregated, hyperconverged. It drives these multiple. It drives these multiple form factors. Um, but people, um, I believe, really should focus more on the commonality between all of those. Right. So we're really designed around a common connector and interface. Uh, the connector, the SFFTA1002, uh, really enabled us to um, use this um, to build a, build a common connector, which is also used for other applications, such as the OCP NIC 3.0 um, and, a, and a couple other devices out there. Um, this ultimately prevents us from stranding lanes um, between, um, like if you were to use a OCP NIC or an E3, um, you have some flexibility there where you have now the same connector, you could potentially use the same slot. Um, also, um, we designed around a common framework. So while um, each of the mechanical form factors is physically different, they follow a common set of, specif common set of specifications, which, kind of, which gives the de device a similar look and feel, gives us, um, from a device vendor perspective, perspective, it gives us kind of an easier um, time validating and understanding the requirements um, from the system side, it's the, 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 same, the same possibility. Um, so a lot of this flexibility that we've built in over the last few years has really allowed EDSFF to cover more than just storage and has given us the ability to kind of start expanding. Um, so next slide. So, um, with the needs of the server um, progressive, progressing uh, rapidly, we really needed to make a lot of updates to the specifications. Um, so really, I'm, I'm kind of highlighting three of the uh, updates that are coming. Um, there are more expected soon. Um, really, the, um, the glue of the spec is, the glue of all the specifications is the SFFTA1009. This is our pin signal specification. Um, this defines the common look and feel across all the mechanical um, 
devices that are listed in EDSFF. Um, so the spec was about two years old since we um, last re revised it. So we really had a lot of learnings to kind of go into the specification. One of the key ads we had to do um, that we felt we needed to do was add in um, basically PCIe electrical specifications. Um, in the prior release, we did not have any sort of specifications. Um, we were relying on what was out there for the standard PCIe card um, specification. And what we realized is that, hey, we have a pretty good connector. We have a form factor that, or form set of form factors that are not a PCIe card. So they have a different, um, they have a l different characteristics. And so what we did is we evolved the specification to be able to support um, new electricals, um, to support basically its own electricals. Um, in addition, um, after those two years that I mentioned of learnings, we had a lot of cleanup to make. Um, we needed to fix errata, close ambiguities, and add new specs where um, specs were really needed. Um, so there was some incremental changes that we basically made um, that went into this um, spec. And this was just published in the last, um, a little bit over a month now. Um, one of the other key changes that has occurred, um, this one a little bit older, but um, still relatively recent is SFFTA 1008. Um, there were some major changes that uh, went into the specification with the goal of maximum flexibility of the device. Uh, the length of the, uh, what we call the E3S, the short version was grown slightly and that allowed flexibility where if I was as a device manufacturer, I now have the option to be, be able to take my same E1.S um, motherboard and plug it into either the E3 or the E1. So that gave me some flexibility there from a design perspective. Um, some of the other stuff is the connector position um, physically changed. We actually raised the connector position um, for that card specifically, or for the uh, device specifically. And we did this with the idea of interoperability around those slots, going back to the, uh, the, um, the stranded lane concept of trying to prevent that as much as possible. Um, and there were several other changes as well that were made. Um, finally, I wanted to touch on a new spec that is currently in, in draft form right now, um, which is the SFFTA 1023, which is a, a thermal characterization spec. Um, really the specification's purpose is to have a common method um, for devices to characterize their, their thermal design and reporting. Um, and as I mentioned before, there will be incremental updates as well. I don't see any like major changes coming down the pipe. Um, hopefully we're not planning on making any sort of um, major changes, but we will adapt to the needs of the server industry. And so we are planning on making um, minor updates to clean, do further cleanup of the specifications. Um, last page. So finally, um, so to meet the growing attach of EDSFF, we actually changed the name. Um, so EDSFF is already a mouthful, um, but we changed the name of what EDSFF stands for. Um, we, we're now calling it the Enterprise and Data Center Standard Form Factor um, to reflect the fact that there is interest of using these form factors for more than just SSDs. And we are focused on that going forward. Um, if you wanna learn more, um, please see the specifications. Um, I've got them all uh, listed out. I did not list the draft of 1023, but you can go to the link um, uh, right there and uh, go that go hit it. And then um, if you want to uh, participate in the specs, please join SFF, please join OCP, and then finally adopt EDSFF. And with that, I will turn it back to you, Jam. Thanks, Anthony. Yeah, no, I'm I'm really excited for there to be you know, having a server slot in the back that you can put an OCP NIC in or a high performance SSD, or if you wanted to in the future, put a bunch of uh, persistent memory in there, you know, the same slot, uh, that's really exciting. And I think, you know, just to reiterate what Anthony said about, you know, making the spec very amenable to PCIe Gen 5. And, you know, certainly a lot of us have been spending a lot of time talking to customers about, you know, how EDSFF and all these new form factors work specifically to enhance and move the PCIe Gen 5 ecosystem along much faster when we get there. So uh, exciting times. Uh, thank you, Anthony. Um, and again, appreciate all the hard work you do in the SFF work group with the, all the other uh, gentlemen on the phone here. So thanks. <laughs> all right. Um, so uh, we're going to switch gears a little bit because we're going to come back to um, 
uh, we're, we're going to talk a lot about uh, EDSF today, but also we're going to talk about the OCP uh, NVMe SSD spec. So it was the OCP Cloud NVMe SSD spec that was generated by Facebook and Microsoft. Uh, it has expanded quite a bit beyond that. And anybody who's been in the OCP work group over the last uh, you know, six months, uh, it's been a really exciting time to, oh, we're, we're getting so close to having a form factor um, in a, um, and a specification for hyperscale and data center that actually expands to some enterprise use cases. And if we can get uh, a lot of commonality between at least the form factors and um, a lot of the other features on the NVMe SSDs between enterprise and data center, that's a huge win for the SSD vendors like myself. So uh, Lee, I'm going to introduce you and uh, Lee Pruitt from Microsoft is going to walk you through the state of the union for uh, the OCP NVMe SSD spec. Oh, good morning, Lee. Oh, I think you're on mute still. There we go. The organizer muted me and I, I was uh, cut off. <laughs> so, yes, so uh, John Michael, thank you for the introduction. Um, I wanted to kind of touch a little bit today on the upcoming uh, 2.0 version um, of the OCP specification. Uh, we have been uh, diligently working on this um, over the last year since the 1.0 uh, uh, introduction of the spec from Facebook and Microsoft. And uh, we have uh, quite a few major additions as well as a, a whole heap of uh, minor additions and clarifications. So some of the big additions here, um, one that uh, Ross drove into the spec was a latency monitoring feature. Um, this is a log page and a get set feature combination that together allow us to uh, set up bucketing for the latency measurements of IOs. And this is a very cool way to be able to quickly identify latency outliers um, and where they're coming from. So in this case, uh, oftentimes, uh, unfortunately, there's uh, sometimes some uh, finger pointing between the host and the device on where these things happen. Um, and in this case, this is gonna tell us exactly at the interface uh, which side the problem would lie on and how we could then debug it very quickly. Um, some uh, uh, more additions, um, we've uh, done so uh, basically um, another log page called the unsupported requirements log page. Um, this is kind of interesting in the sense of, hey, um, you know, as we add new features and as devices evolve, um, obviously we're going to have uh, devices that come in that aren't going to meet some of the new stuff, um, but they will over time. And so how do we kind of monitor um, or understand in our fleets um, in the field uh, what a given device does do and doesn't do. And so with that, we can then tune the software um, to very quickly and easily uh, work with devices that may not have all the latest and greatest yet. Um, another one is we've uh, added some additions. Um, this is from an escape in the field from uh, Microsoft specifically, where um, we were having um, some data loss possibilities that we wanted to close with PLP um, cap failure. Um, and so we now have the ability to tune that well how often the device uh, looks and adjust the, the time between so that we can minimize possible data loss scenarios. Um, there's thermal throttling requirements, a lot of stuff around um, the, the basic management command and also the uh, additional security requirements, um, which uh, we'll, we will always be adding more security requirements because the security folks are always coming up with new ways to plug holes that hackers are trying to uh, circumvent. Uh, as well as uh, one of the, the <laughs> interestingly uh, uh, surprisingly uh, robust topics in the spec um, is the label requirement. Um, we've done a bunch of, of beef of up with that to have a common label across uh, across the industry for these devices. So next slide. So as I talked about the 1.0 version of the spec, that was just kind of Ross and me getting together uh, as Microsoft and Facebook um, and kind of putting our two uh, requirements documents together. Um, and out of that came the the 1.0 and the 1.0a. Um, with that, um, we've we've as you can see here, we've we've gotten a little bit of traction with that. Um, and with that, uh, as part of the 2.0 process, uh, HP and Dell have also joined um, this group um, to add some of the enterprise perspective to this. Um, uh, out of that, um, we've renamed the, the specification instead of because cloud is kind of data center. So this will be both 
uh, hyperscaler clouds and enterprise data centers uh, together. Um, and we've added some things that um, more the are uh, somewhat enterprise-ish, I would say. Uh, not to say that uh, you know the hyperscalers won't have use cases for some of these things going forward. Um, that's all kind of uh, all goodness in the sense of uh, this is all forward-looking stuff for for all of us. Um, so around the uh, some new command supports required. Uh, being more fine-grained about device capabilities and what capabilities of given commands have been tested. Um, maybe the big one really is the uh, full-on MVME MI support, um, so MCTP and all that. Um, some of that is, uh, shall we say, also forward-looking for uh, certainly for Microsoft, if not Facebook as well. Um, so that's uh, all goodness um, and makes uh, Austin Bolin very happy. Uh, that we're all adopting that. Uh, some more component measure and authentication stuff that's around security again. Um, and then the device profiles is really, um, at the end of the day, yes, there are some differences that we kind of have to account for, uh, but the idea is that the specification as a whole um, you know, derives all of the different requirements for all of us. And then at the end of say, maybe the manufacturing line, we hope that there's just a few switches that need to be thrown. Uh, that kind of um, tunes the device for a one use case or another. Next slide. So with that, um, right now, um, we do have a few more of these that have added in a later draft, but uh, as you say, of you can see, I believe as of our, our seven draft, we only had five. So there were just five differences between the hyperscalers and the data center folks. And some of these are really not, um, you know, protocol or, or low layer uh, difference. It's more how things are kind of configured within the device. So you can think, see things around block, default block size, some things around the number of namespaces to be reported, retention, that sort of thing. And then, oh, yeah, uh, how, how thick we let you make your M2s. But of course, since M2 is going away, as we were talking about all day today, um, that hopefully is not, not a big thing. Next. So kind of, I don't need to go through this in detail. Um, this is kind of an R chart here. This kind of just talks about some of the minor additions that we've done across the spec. Um, so little things that, uh, that either came up um, uh, questions from vendors, um, things that we found, so failure analysis in the field that we wanted to close uh, gaps on, um, all that sort of stuff. Uh, so, and with that, thank you for your time. Awesome, thanks Lee. Yeah, I know, uh, again, you guys put a, a large amount of work into <laughs> Uh, reviewing that, I know I, I sent you quite a bit of feedback, and I'm sure you got, I, I think you had like hundreds of uh, comments on the Rev2 spec before you guys got the, the comments fully integrated. So, appreciate yes, all had, the hard work. We had on the order of 270 comments from all of the vendors and, and other interested parties. So, uh, that was uh, very good, uh, really good feedback. Um, took us a while to get through it. Uh, we've gone through that now, and uh, yeah, so thank you everybody for your hard work and, and input. Yeah, if it wasn't clear, you know, uh, for from the SSD vendor standpoint, to be able to have like one common firmware and there just be like one or two tiny changes between some of these major customers uh, is a huge win, and it's going to be uh, greatly accelerate the time to market for many of these new MVME products. And I know that's been a really challenging part of uh, SSD vendors supporting a broad set of enterprise and cloud requirements across a bunch of different product lines, and uh, this will really help. We're I've been telling my product teams every day like this is the great spec. <laughs> Just implement everything. We're gonna <laughs> go go for it. It's gonna be the the future that we standardize on. So, thank you again, uh, Lee and company. So, all right. Um, so the next part of our agenda is when we start getting into the system uh, implementations. Um, we're first, uh, Roth. I'm gonna have you kick us off, uh, and then we're gonna go into uh, Mr. Paul Kaler from HPE, Mr. Bill Lynn of Dell, and then Jonathan Hinkle of Lenovo to walk you through some of the new systems. Uh, first, Ross is going to tell us what Facebook is up to with EDSF and some of these new form factors. So uh, let, me, let me pull up your slides here, Ross. And uh... Great. Th thanks, John Michael. Let's wait for the slides here, and then we'll get started. It's uh, 
Great to be here today. This is like the friends and family of storage day. So, <laughs> great. Thank you. So let's start off with Facebook today. We have 3.3 billion people monthly using our apps and 2.6 billion people daily. It's a lot of people and we want them to have the best experience possible. We want to have a great experience and just be able to be more connected in the world. If you look at this picture here, this is one aisle and one data center with lots of storage, compute, network needed to give our users the best experience possible. This is just one aisle, one data center, and uh, we have a bunch of data centers. With that, let's go to the next slide. Let's talk about E1S and 25 millimeter flash platforms. If we start off to the left here, you'll see a 25 millimeter E1S latch. What's really nice about this is it enables us to quickly service the box, pull the drive out of the box and back in. Going down on the left, you see a 1OU blade. As you can see, the blade can quickly and easily be serviced in the box. You see how there is storage in the front of the blade and compute in the back of the blade. Then continuing down here, you see the 1OU blades in a 4OU chassis. As you can see, there are a lot of blades in this chassis, enabling great density. Then on the right, you see a chassis with two OU blades and how it gives you more flexibility within this chassis for other options. And that also enables us to build a rack with up to 96 blades. You see the picture on the right. It's a lot of blades in a rack. So what does this result in? At the end of the day, this benefits us with high density. This can enable up to six petabytes per rack. That's a lot of storage. Low airflow CFM per watt. We certainly don't want to run out of airflow and we certainly don't want to run out of power. It enables flexible CPU to flash ratios. People have lots of needs of what this ratio should be and this is very flexible in that it allows lots of mix and matching and great serviceability. We got to keep all this equipment running and make it work. And so it works really well for that. And let's go to the next slide here. Let's also talk about the data center NVMe SSD specification. As has been talked earlier, it really aligns the SSD needs and requirements between hyperscalers, OEMs, and the SSD makers. What's included, it talks about NVMe Express, PCI SIG, smart logs, reliability, thermal, power, security, form factors, SM bus tooling, everything needed to build a data center NVMe SSD. If you look down at the bottom of the slide here, there's a link to the 1.0 specification. You can find this under the OCP contributions. And it's a great resource for this. Version 2.0 is coming soon. And, and this, what this all amounts to is the data center, NVMe, SSD, and E1S, the next gen generation technology, and they're ready now to solve today's problems, which is great for our users to have the best experience possible. So with that, thank you for your time today. Thanks, Ross. And yeah, if you guys are members uh, to the OCP storage work group, that's where the uh, draft specs get sent to the distribution and mailing list. So if you are part of the OCP storage work group, just sign up for the, for the email list and you'll be able to see it's, uh, these 2.0 specs and you'll be able to see how the sausage is made. There's a lot of uh, back and forth on uh, as, as these specs get iterated. All right. So thank you, Ross. Um, cool. Let me, Paul, let me pull up your guys' slides here and we will be on our way. And Paul, why don't you introduce yourself while I'm doing that? You bet. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Paul Kaler. I'm a future storage uh, architect for HPE. And uh, so <clears throat> today I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about what, uh, we got the wrong slides there. Whoops. I think we've got the, um, we're gonna talk a little bit about how uh, E3.S enables uh, next-gen devices. I think we've got a lot of people talking about that. And then we're gonna touch on the, uh, kind of how we're dealing with open NVMe SSD specs with the data, data center, uh, in, OCP and BME spec as well. All right, so let's jump into it. All right, so as we've been talking a lot about, uh, I think Patrick mentioned earlier about the transition from two and a half inch to these future form factors, uh, we really see uh, E3.S at HPE as a really easy way to transition our customers over to these next gen devices. 
So uh, if you look at an E3.S and a 2U uh, implementation, it's really nice because uh, you can see here like this prototype over here to the right, 2U designs can share the same chassis uh, as existing form factors. So that safe kind of, uh, you know, is it safe to buy the two and a half inch versus its future form factor? This really enables customers to decide, you know, hey, I still have some needs for SAS or SATA, but I can transition and put EDSFF right next to my two and a half inch uh, drive base. So I can make that transition easier. They can mix and match between SAS and SATA and NVMe. And then eventually, hopefully, right, we get them over to an all EDSFF future where we're all NVMe and we've transitioned to one interface, which I think everybody would love to be able to do. A couple of the things that we really see beneficial with the E3 form factor in particular is the ability to be able to swap out and kind of mix in the right performance. So you can swap two thin uh, form factors out for one E3.S2T uh, thick form factor. And so that might help if you're using mainstream uh, SSDs, which are like SATA SSD replacements. Maybe you want to take two of those out and then you want to swap in a 2T, which might be a, a really high performance device. Or as you can see here, not only can you intermix thins and thicks on E3.S, but you can uh, intermix device types. So we haven't really talked about CXL yet, but that's going to be a future device type that we see uh, coming down the road that this form factor also enables beyond just NVMe. So now you can have NVMe devices sitting right next to CXL devices, and you can swap out two thin mainstream NVMe devices and put in one really high performance, high power CXL device. So of course, all of those shared bays has really great flexibility for the customer, uh, and that reduces their costs because they don't have to buy different servers for different uh, form factors that they might want to implement. One of the other big advantages uh, that we really like about E3 is it's a, a good size form factor. As you can see, it's, it's very similar in form factor size to the two and a half inch, and that enables it to support really large FPGAs and SOCs. So again, talking about these future device types and wanting to have a, a form factor that can last for a really long time, uh, it can support things like uh, front-facing I.O., like a NIC. Some of these things, uh, like accelerators we've talked about in general purpose of like TPUs or GPUs that might have these larger SOCs on them. And then we're also uh, computational storage devices. It's a, another big technology that's coming in the storage space. And th those are great uh, devices to be able to use this future form factor. And then I think we had a little bit of touching on airflow and thermals. I think Patrick was mentioning that and said, you know, hey, that's that's kind of hard to sell. But but one of the advantages here really is it's not just in the form factor that uh, provides it, but it's really that that enables higher TDP downstream components, right? So now you might be able to fit more GPUs in your server. And so I think that's how we're going to approach it when we talk to customers is, hey, this is a greater, uh, better thermal advantage, you get more airflow. And hey, but the real reason why that's interesting, why do I care, right, as a customer? Well, because you can put, you know, a higher TDP CPU in here, or you can put uh, more GPUs in the box now. So that's something that really enables. And then, of course, it also enables higher performance devices themselves because we can cool them because of the better airflow. So we can jump to the next slide. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about, well, wh why is the thermals better and how does that enable all that great stuff with better TDPs downstream? Well, it's pretty simple if you just look at this. This is a scaled version over here on the right. You've got the E3 connector, and this is great because this is the shared connector that uh, we talked about earlier. This is the same connector that E1 uses and E3, so it's all the same unified connector. And you can see for a by 4 interface, four lanes of PCIe, compared to the 2.5 inch SFF8639, it's maybe half the size. You know, it's a little bit more than half the size, but that, of course, means we can make smaller back planes. That reduces the airflow impedance, and that means higher powers capable up to 40 watts for a E3S uh, 2T thick device. And of course, that we believe from what we're seeing in the industry right now on PCIe Gen 5, that's going to be a great enabler of that technology because to saturate a PCIe Gen 5 uh, interface, you need a lot of power. That, that's a lot of horsepower that you need there. Same thing for CXL devices. They're using the same PCIe Gen 5 by 4 interface. So that will really enable full saturation of that interface. And not only that, but as we see this connector uh, have really, really good SI, and we expect it to be able to get to PCIe Gen 6 SI capabilities, this 40 watts provides a really great uh, thermal room to grow uh, so that even when we get to that PCIe Gen 6 type of performance, uh, we expect this connector will still give us the thermal capabilities to have those type of devices at full performance. 
And then one of the other things I wanted to touch on was, you know, cost-effective performance scaling. Again, talking about the mixing and the matching of E3 uh, thin and thick devices really allows a customer to kind of dial in the performance that they need. So if they wanted to optimize their performance and they didn't want to have too many devices, but they wanted to go to fewer thick devices that were really targeted high performance, they can do that. And by reducing their device count, uh, you may not have to put in PCIe switches. Uh, you can imagine if you had, you know, a box that had uh, just tens and tens and tens of devices, at some point you've got to, you're going to run out of PCIe lanes, you've got to add switches. Uh, so this really enables them to reduce that. And of course, that gives you a higher MTBF. The fewer devices you have in your, in your server, you get higher MTBF and a lower solution cost if you don't have to add PCIe switches. And then wanted to talk a little bit about One U as well. The E3 Thin uh, variation uh, is really great for One U. It gives you good performance density. You can see here the, <clears throat> the picture at the bottom here, you can now fit 20 uh, drives compared to two and a half inch. So it gives you twice the IOPS and bandwidth. So that's a, a great benefit for One U as well. And that enables us to use the same form factor across both of our Two U and our One U portfolio, uh, even in blades. And so this is great because if we can kind of consolidate our form factor and volumes down to as few form factors as possible. Let's go to the next slide. All right, so here I wanted to touch a little bit about how HPE kind of got interested in the OCP data center NVMe SSD spec. Um, so if you guys aren't aware, HPE typically, uh, you know, we, we develop our own custom firmware specifications we have for many, many years. And we do that because there's some critical benefits that we get, um, right? So we can ensure consistent behavior across our entire uh, drive portfolio. That really uh, lets us do things like specify uh, any kind of vagueness that's in the industry standard specs. We can specify that to be, this is exactly how we want it to, to work. Um, it also allows us to specify any optional features and make those mandatory. So we get really good consistent behavior across uh, multiple suppliers, which leads right into a great assurance of supply. Uh, right, because now you've got that consistent behavior across multiple sources, so you can do multi-sourcing. Uh, we also were able to add some additional telemetry and metadata logs into our firmware spec, so that lets us do faster issue resolution and figure out and debug things when they go wrong. Then, of course, you know we learn a lot of lessons over time, so we can spec those things into our into our specifications and get improved quality over time from doing that. So when we looked at the OCP cloud spec, we saw a lot of that same stuff going on in there and said, hey, this is great. Uh, we've got a lot of commonality with that, a lot of the same features and requirements. So we started looking at that and saying, well, okay, if we could leverage that uh, spec and add in some of our requirements, we could really drive some economies of scale, then that would really improve quality again, because there's, uh, like John Michael mentioned earlier, if everybody can be developing one single firmware and everyone's testing that one single firmware, that results in a lot better quality. Uh, hopefully that's our goal. One of the other big benefits I think you'll hear from later from some uh, third party testers, uh, right now you have a, an open requirements document, it's great because they can look through that spec and they can know exactly what they need to write their test spec to. There's no kind of hidden features or anything. So they can have a really com uh, complete third party test a spec and that gives uh, everybody of course better quality as well because more things are getting tested and it's very open and, and uh, transparent. So as, uh, as Lee was talking about, uh, HPE, Dell, uh, Facebook, and Microsoft, we've been working towards this common spec for both the enterprise and the cloud use cases combined. Uh, we've added some new things uh, that uh, Lee went over a whole bunch of those. Uh, one of the big ones was we added in uh, E3.S, and of course that's part of the EDSFF family. And the great news is it's almost complete, right? So that's awesome. We're, uh, we've been doing a ton of work on this. Uh, we hope to be releasing the final uh, specification very soon. And with that, I'll kick it back to you, John Michael. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, and uh, you know, just to reiterate what Paul said, I'm so excited for low cost, flexible attach of NVMe devices on standard enterprise servers, just to be able to pick what I want and not pay a bunch of extra money for backplanes and, and power supplies and crazy fans for NVMe. We will have NVMe as a first class citizen in enterprise servers is uh, gonna <laughs> bring me much joy, Paul. So that'd be great. <laughs> um, all right, uh, we are going to go to. Oops, sorry, uh, Bill. Going to re rewind back to the Bill slides. Sorry, a little got a little out of order here. But uh, Bill, welcome. Ah, thank you, John Michael. Uh, my name's Bill Lynn. I'm a system architect with the uh, server division at Dell, and I've been working on the E3 form factors for several years uh, so 
Uh, let's go to the first slide. So essentially what I wanted to talk about, and I'm basically just going to you know, go over almost the exact same points that Paul just went over is, you know, from a Dell's point of view, we, we really, really like the E3 form factor. It's a family of devices that include the E3 long, the E3 short, uh, the thick and thin, because it's a, it's a form factor that allows us to do more than just uh, SSDs. It allows us to do a lot of other devices uh, in a common uh, framework. So go to the next slide, please. So like I said, it's it's a family of devices. We can have a common uh, device bay mechanics where smaller devices fit into larger bays. Larger devices can fit into multiples of uh, small bays. One of the nice things about E3 is it supports multiple link widths. We can go by two, by four, by eight, by 16, which means not only can we do SSDs, we can do uh, you know, front-facing NICs, we can do uh, storage class memory, we can even do uh, low to mid-range uh, GP GPUs for inference or some other use cases. Um, the E3s have, um, we went with a wraparound carrier for the E3s because one of the issues that we ran into in the beginning was um, every OEM likes to customize their ID look and feel and the uh, wraparound carrier allows us a lot of flexibility in that space and still allows us to use a common device. So if you go to the next uh, slide, please. If you look at it from uh, a system point of view, as, as Paul showed, the, the E3, in a one U uh, server configuration allows you a bunch of uh, options. You can either completely fill up the front with 20 E3 devices, which gives you an incredible amount of uh, performance, or you could fill it up with 10 E3 2T devices or the thick devices, which is roughly equivalent to what the two and a half inch drives do today. So that's makes for sort of an easy migration from the 2.5 inch to the the new e3s but one of the things that dell's really excited about is given the higher performance uh, processors and memory and you know the gp gpus we now have to think of airflow as as a device or or a component of the chassis design so having uh this form factor allows us to uh put in large airflow channels and still maintain a very, very high level of performance. So we can basically carve out a big channel in the middle of the server for airflow to cool the CPUs and all the downstream devices and still have up to 16 E3 devices or eight you know, E3 uh, thick devices. The other thing it allows us to do is intermix uh, SSDs with, like I said, storage class memory or the the uh, full height 2x devices that could be either I/O, could be a NIC, it could be a GP GPU, anything like that. So this form factor gives us a lot of flexibility. If you go to the next slide, uh, here's some 2U examples. Uh, we can put in up to uh, 40 or yeah, in this case, uh, uh, 40 E3 devices and still have uh, lots of uh, room for airflow. Or we can, like I said, carve out the, uh, the center channel for airflow for the uh, downstream devices and still have up to 32 devices. Or, you know, if you wanted to do intermixing, you can still have an airflow channel and you can put in, you know, storage class memory, front-facing I/O. Just it gives us a, a phenomenal amount of flexibility, not only in the form factor, uh, being able to provide airflow, but the higher power on the devices also allows us to do some interesting things. Uh, we can go to 40 watts on an E3 short uh, 2T device, or we can go up to 70 watts on an E3 
uh, 2T long device. At 70 watts, uh, we can do some interesting things with uh, GP, GPUs or very, very high performance NICs. Uh, go to the next slide. So here's an example of, we basically took an OCP3 NIC uh, PCB and overlaid it on top of the E3 short uh, form factor. And as uh, Anthony mentioned uh, earlier in this presentation, one of the things we did with the E3 was we actually shifted the connector position up in the form factor. That gave us a couple of different benefits. One, it allowed us to basically reuse an uh, E1S uh, PCB inside of an E3 case. You know, if um, SSD vendors wanted to like build one PCB for a particular uh, capacity point, and then they could use it in, in an E1S uh, implementation or an E3S. But the other thing that uh, shifting the connector position up, it allowed us to put a 4C plus uh, connector in that space, which meant we could go and use the OCP3 NIC boards uh, with a very small modification in this form factor. And if you have a thick device, you can also fit the connector cages and everything else. So the E3 just gives us a, a huge amount of uh, flexibility that uh, extra tab at the bottom of the 4C Plus uh, is used for all the sideband signals that the OCP3 NIC needs. But another possibility is we could use that as a, as a higher power uh, tab that we can bring in additional power and maybe go beyond the 70 watts. So this allows us a huge amount of flexibility and Dell, Dell is, is really excited to see where we can take this uh, form factor. Um, and with that, uh, I'll turn it back over to John Michael. Thanks, Bill. And uh, yeah, it's funny, you know, Bill, Bill and I have been talking about E3 and EDSFF for a very long time. So <laughs> I'm glad it's finally, yes. finally figured out the, the final spec and, you know, we're generating lots of uh, awesome products um, in, in the roadmap to, to go support that. So. Uh, thank you, Bill. And I'm going to welcome Jonathan Hinkle from Lenovo. Uh, Jonathan, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi there. This is Jonathan Hinkle. I'm a distinguished researcher at Lenovo. And today I'm going to be talking to you about what's shipping now in a server near you, EDSFF. Next slide. So what you've been hearing about, I think, especially with the, the previous presentations, the promise of EDSFF, we really created this family of devices that were truly optimized for the data center. And that's better cooling, better power delivery, uh, the density of drives, and also feature proof um, for interfaces like CXL, where you need the 32 gigabits per second faster, uh, along with PCIe, and interchangeable even in the same slots, which is a very interesting feature. Um, so we have new applications we can support, such as memory. I presented last week on, at the Persistent Memory Summit, how we can expand memory uh, over CXL, these new um, form factors. Um, and also accelerators, uh, where you can do computation on each device and, and scale that out on the number of devices. Uh, but all of our EDSFF designs, they all support that same industry standard EDSFF connector, which is really a key uh, aspect of the behavior and, and where they all come in this common family. Um, we see value in the, um, the E1.S, the 1U rack space optimized E1.S, which really can go into any server, 1U server and so on vertically. And also in the E3S is a sort of a 2U optimized um, form factor that fits well and, and allows for higher power when we want those higher performance kind of drives or higher performance kind of devices. And then there's E1.L where you have the, the highest capacity and, and you can do that remotely. Um, and so with all of these, we've been talking about these uh, benefits that we expect and, and you know, concepts around it for a long time. You can see a prototype from one of the earliest uh, E1.S from Lenovo. Um, but now I get to show you a little bit more and actually what's actually shipping now. So it's not just, I, I heard the question was, when will servers have this? And thankfully now we can say it's today. So next slide. So this is uh, Lenovo's newest uh, long, line of one use server. We basically have support for EDSFF E1.S. This is our high volume mainstream general purpose server for both hyperscale and enterprise. Uh, Lenovo has 
significant business, both in hyperscale and enterprise, uh, all the way down to SMB and up to the tier one hyperscale. Um, so we want uh, different offerings that allow for leveraging these values uh, in different spaces. Um, so I get to tell you a little bit now about what are the use cases that we can see um, leveraging the technology and actually into a product. Um, this one has 16 E1.S drives. Uh, so where we typically have only eight or maybe maybe 10 U.2s today, um, this can fit 16. So we get at least a 60%, up to a 60% storage performance increase. Um, we have these number, this number of by four NVMe drives with the E1.S. Um, at the same time, these are lower power devices. So each one of these is, is easy to cool. It could be around 12 watts, for example. Um, and also there's a spacing. You can see the opening here. We, once you take off these little front panels, you can see the spacing. So we have plenty of airflow for the drives themselves, but also not just the drives, but the processors and the memory behind them. So um, it really gives you this optimized airflow for system uh, TCO. Uh, also, these are mainstream NVMe drives, so we don't have to have the highest power. Certainly, we can have higher performance SSDs in the E1 to S up to uh, 25 watts in the future, uh, and especially the, like you saw some of the designs that, that Ross showed. Um, but these are mainstream NVMe drives, so they can be uh, basically lower cost overall and uh, giving the lower power, but then give us higher performance. Um, so this is our general purpose server shipping today. Next slide. So another way we've, we're able to use E1.S is in our SR670. It's really focused on AI acceleration. And so this is a 3U box, and you can see there's a large number of slots here in the front for an adapter card, uh, for adapter cards. And basically, you know, we have some other offerings where we have two and a half inch U.2 and so on to feed the, the data, basically to feed those accelerators uh, for, for, especially for AI. But the problem is um, basically we were taking up space for the slots. And so with EDSFF, E1.S, we were able to fit six E1.S drives in a more dense configuration and allow for the highest performance and higher uh, capacity while still enabling more space for AI accelerators, which is the main purpose of the box. So in this case, we're really leveraging that density and allowing for a greater capability of the other purpose of the box, which is really around this uh, GPU slots. So next slide. So this is another way we've been able to use E1.S is through uh, switching out the, the two two and a half inch drives in each one of these blade servers, we were able to also support six NV, uh, NVMe drives with E1.S. And so previously with the two drives, then we could we could do a mirror, we could do some kind of um, you know basic storage in a blade server, but um, it was still limited. And so with the E1.S, we were able to put in six and get a really high performance and still get good airflow uh, where it doesn't block the airflow to the processors. You can see down here. There's two processors in each one of these uh, compute sleds. There's a bunch of DEMs, I.O., all contained in this small half wide. And you know, in, in basically a, a two and a half inch drive, we can't, you can barely fit a uh, six maybe, but you can't fit that uh, across, but you can't fit that in the depth with the, the DEMs. But here with E1 to S, we're able to fit six drives in that same blade. So now we get enough capacity and enough storage performance uh, to make it really useful for new workloads where that wasn't enabled before. So I think that's it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jonathan. These are awesome systems, mostly because they have an Intel SSD in them. <laughs> uh, yeah, and and just the coolest thing about EDSFF and when we tell customers, like you have to have U.2 performance in a smaller form factor, and it's literally exactly the same performance as our U.2 version of the P4510 in, in a smaller form factor. It's an awesome product. Um, and we're gonna hear all kinds of new awesome products here very shortly. So. Thank you, Jonathan. I really appreciated that. Um, let me pull up um, the next round of slides real quick. I don't know why my Outlook decided to open in the window that I'm sharing. That's not a good thing to do. Uh, <laughs> but let me pull up this. Uh, Lee, do you want to hop back on real quick? Sure. Yeah, this, I know we're uh, slightly behind schedule, so sorry guys, but we will still have time for talk. questions. Um, we'll, we'll make sure we're, we are speedy. So, all right. Lee, hey, take great. So uh, as you uh, probably can tell, I'm not Jason Adrian. Um, Lee Pruitt, again, from Microsoft. Uh, Jason wasn't able to be here today, so I'm kind of 
stealing some of his slides to talk about some of the things that we're doing with E1.S. Next. So, you know, how do we get there? I, you know, this one, you, you see all the thing, I think uh, uh, Bill and Paul and um, Jonathan have all kind of gone through this in depth, but, you know, we're just kind of hammering on the same story here where, um, yeah, you two could have been uh, an option, but really for um, Azure and the way we do things, we really like one U uh, device, you know, boxes. And so uh, a device that's really uh, fitted for one U use cases um, was, was pretty important. Um, so you two didn't quite cut it. Next. So with that, um, last year, uh, I'm sure many of you were involved in all of this um, in OCP and um, in general, um, where we wanted to go through and design a form factor. Obviously, with the E1S and the E3 and the shorts and the longs, there are lots of form factors to choose from. Um, uh, but in reality, as Jonathan, or um, excuse me, Anthony um, said earlier, uh, the high order bit here is that this is a common connector with common pin signaling. And so around that, you know, is there ability to put different casings um, for different system configurations and different uh, power uh, envelopes um, is pretty important because that enables different use cases across um, a wide range of uh, workloads and hyperscale enterprise, et cetera. So with that, um, Microsoft uh, kind of decided that we went out there, um, you know, there was the nine millimeter and the 25 millimeter. Um, nine millimeter didn't quite have the power envelope for us. Um, 25 millimeter, um, wow, well, um, you know, working really well in, in uh, Ross's optimized boxes for lots and lots of devices. We have some, uh, the use cases that were primary use case that we're looking at here is for the local storage for Azure compute and being able to fit enough of those on a given node, especially as the CPU core counts go up. Thank you, John Michael, um, that we needed a form factor that kind of in between there. So, you know, a, Goldi a Goldilocks form factor. Next. So here's kind of a concept of one of the Project Olympus boxes. Um, you can see here um, with the ability to have a couple of PCI uh, accelerator cards, a couple of OCP NICs, and four E1.S devices inside to be able to balance the, the, the network to the uh, CPU, to the memory, and to the storage. So with that, I mean, this is a very much a IOPS um, uh, intensive um, use case uh, such that we need to balance between um, the the ability of the, of the storage devices to, to supply apps to the CPUs as well as the data ingest and out just from the OCP NICs. Next. So here's kind of a nice little picture. Um, this is uh, using our uh, design for the latch. Um, right now, one of the things that we see is that, yes, kind of each uh, company right now is kind of responsible for their own latch design. Uh, but this, you know, the way this set up with the ability of the fins um, on that 15 millimeter to, you know, deliver the airflow needed to cool that device in a dense uh, server package. Next. So. We're kind of uh, unlocking the potential here of these new form factor devices. Um, we really um, are very happy to be moving away from M.2. Um, it, it has uh, quite a few, um, you know, downsides. It was great for the time that we needed it. Um, we could shove a whole bunch of them all over the different places inside the server as needed, but um, they came with a lot of trade-offs. And so we think that the E1S is uh, kind of uh, eliminates almost all of those those bad points, um, full performance, uh, hot plug, uh, and then obviously now as we're moving into it, uh, we're getting uh, into a broad uh, ecosystem to support that. We are now actually uh, shipping E1S and, of course, E1L as well. So we like both those form factors. Um, there is broad adoption for those uh, across all of Azure, both Azure Compute and Azure Storage. Thanks. So what's next? Um, as, we, as everybody's been talking about here, I think E1 uh, or EDSFF in general is here. 
Um, we are very sanguine about the 15 millimeter size. Uh, we like the ability that it can move to Gen 4 and Gen 5 in the future. Um, you know, it allows a lot of new use cases for us, especially in compute, as I've said, uh, as cache drives and Azure storage um, and in uh, certain workloads across uh, Exchange and other places that were not really being uh, fully realized with M.2. Um, we think M.2 may uh, stay around for a while, uh, use cases for boot drives, uh, but really uh, for you know those data drives where we need that performance, we need that power envelope, um, we need the density, frankly. Um, uh, M.2 will kind of fade away and E1S will be the dominant going forward. Next. So um, I think, yeah, Jason, let me make sure that I plugged uh, the broader community. Please get involved. Please contribute. Um, one of the main areas that we really would love to see some more innovation in is the latch design. Can we come up with a one or two of, uh, of those to uh, put into OCP so that we have a common connector or, an, or we have a common connector, excuse me, common latch design across the industry um, that uh, eases the time to market for everybody. Um, and of course, uh, please get involved. So the storage working group, um, there's quite a few initiatives. Um, obviously, we have things around NVMe HDD, uh, HDD uh, acoustics and vibration, all kinds of different things that are happening within the storage working group that we want people to please come and get involved in. And there, I talked fast. Thank you, Lee. Because uh, yeah, we're we're slightly behind schedule, but lots of exciting stuff. And uh, yeah, if it's not clear, uh, Microsoft Azure all in on Edith Beth. Thanks, thank yeah. you, Lee. <laughs> uh, all right. Um, so Cameron, why don't I invite you up? Uh, I know we're we we had originally ten minutes to allocate it to questions and Q and A. Uh, we might be able to get through a few of them, and I I can uh, you know maybe speed up our, our next some of our next session. But uh, why don't we go ahead and, and Cameron, I want to uh, invite you up and, and you can introduce okay. yourself and answer a few questions. Yeah, uh, we got some uh, um, participant uh, questions um, and we'll, we want to encourage uh, engagement. So thank you for uh, uh, posing questions. So the first one uh, for uh, I, more of a kind of a spec related question um, are uh, maybe for Lee or Anthony, are you planning to add the leakage memory monitor feature? Wow, leakage memory monitoring. Anthony, do you know? I'm not. I'm not familiar with that one. So, um, <laughs> if if the uh, the person asking the question wants to send me an email to to explain more of what they're looking for, um, I'd be happy to talk with them on that. So, okay, I, I need to look up more what 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 the ask is. Okay, all right. The uh, next one, maybe we'll pose this to uh, Bill Lynn of uh, of Dell. Hopefully. Uh, you're still ready and available. Uh, will the EDSFF, uh, EDSFF standards address the challenges with PCIe speed increases and challenges with existing PCIe connector speed restrictions? Uh, yes, we, Anthony, as Anthony mentioned, we are putting in uh, some of the PCIe SI uh, uh, requirements into SFF uh, TA-1009. So that work is ongoing. And uh, yeah, we are definitely looking at uh, the connector, which is TA-1002, to support both PCIe Gen 5 and, and uh, hopefully PCIe Gen 6. But yes, we are going to do that. And Anthony, do you want to chip in on that? Yeah, we're, defi we're definitely looking forward. Um, towards towards uh, beyond uh, 32 giga transfers PCIe Gen 5. So we are thinking 64 giga transfer. We are thinking beyond that even. So um, it's just a matter of of seeing how um, the specs lay out and then starting the discussion as devices as we start device development. So one thing I want to caution everybody is. Uh, Gen 5 support, Gen 6 support is is an entire channel discussion, not just the EDSFF connector. You have to have uh, requirements on the device, on the connector, 
on the the cabling infrastructure all the way back to the CPU. So it, it's an entire channel that you have to work with, not just the the connector on the drive. So it's definitely not a simple question to answer, but it uh, sounds like there's a lot of preparation going for future generations of PCI Express. We are we are definitely working on it. Okay. Um, this one, um, it could go to probably a good number of people, but maybe John Michael, since uh, you're on camera, I'll kind of pose this to you. Uh, EDSFF has uh, many form factors. Do you see customers getting nervous with that uh, as opposed to a more comfortable world with one two and a half inch form factor? Yeah, and so I think that there was this lie that everybody was on the two and a half inch, right? We had people on M.2, we had people that like PCI Express adding cards for CAM, you know, that, there's always been some, you know, different form factor usages for NVMe. Now, the, the cool thing about EDSFF is now you have these different usage models, but they all have the same connector, the same pinout. There's a ton of synergy between the specifications. Um, so they really are truly a family of form factors. And so I, I don't want people to get um, too confused about the, the differences. They're all going to use the same connector and, and they're going to be interoperable in some, in some sense. So you can make them... Uh, as Bill mentioned in his presentation, they actually changed the E3 specification to make the E3 just a little bit longer so that it can fit an E1.S PCB in the E3 enclosure. That's one example of this interoperability. So say, for instance, I'm an SSD vendor and I make a great E1.S drive. Oh, cool. I want to put it in an E3 uh, case. I can do that. And then now it can fit in a, in a standard 2U server. And we don't have to make any modification to the SSD uh, uh, board itself. So uh, there is a ton of synergy. Um, you'll see when we look through the uh, actual overview of, of the different products that uh, there are lots of interesting use cases. Uh, um, Bill and Paul and, and, uh, you know, mentioned all, some of the interesting use cases for enterprise server to use. Um, you know, Jonathan showed an awesome example of an enterprise one use server. So like uh, there, there really is no right answer, um, you know, for, for as far as which one we're going to win. But I, I do have a, a graph I'm, I'm going to show here in a couple of slides that's going to show my view, Intel's view of like what we think um, the segmentation looks like for EDSF, so. Okay. Um, I guess at this point, let's, uh, let's try and get back on, uh, back to the presentations and I see a few more questions coming in, so we'll get to those uh, after the next grouping. All right, thanks. Cool. Okay. Uh, so, you know, we, we actually, you know, kind of did this a little bit out of order, right? I think, um, Really, realistically, we should have done the quick intro in the beginning. I was hoping everybody watched this NIA video, and we've, you know, uh, as we mentioned, we've been dealing with EDSF since you know 2017. So I hope everybody kind of has a baseline introduction about what EDSF is. Uh, but I'm going to give you like the one minute overview, and then before I dive into the Intel presentation, which is like uh, all the cool stuff Intel is doing around EDSF. So uh, what is EDSF? Uh, as as Anthony said. Uh, this morning, you know, it's moving from uh, enterprise and data center SSD form factor to an enterprise and data center standard form factor, which is going to be many more types of device types. But uh, the way I explain it to customers is really this first principles approach to uh, SSD form factor design. It's kind of like the NVMe of form factors. You started fresh, threw out all the legacy and just said, what should an SSD look like? Well, it, you could, it should be high capacity. It should be scalable. It should have good thermals. It should be hot pluggable and serviceable. It should have good manageability. And it was very, very just well thought out. And um, OCP calls this co-optimization, where you're actually designing the SSD along with the server at the same time, and basically saying, okay, what, what does that look like together? Um, and this was the first time that we, we were developing the specs, we were actually looking at the airflow, looking at PCIe signal integrity, looking at PCIe to press Gen 5 loss budget, like all these things that we're just designing the SSD with the chassis and the server at the same time. And it's, it's a very interest, uh, very awesome solution for SSDs. And again, I'm going to show that it's, it's not just one, it's a whole family. Um, the timeline I mentioned, you know, we there was an EDSF work group in 2017. Um, you know, I, I was the product manager for the Intel Ruler. We launched that in 2017, and then we contributed all that back into SNEA at the time. The EDSF work group, SNEA took over the EDSF specifications as part of the SNEA Small Form Factor Working Group. And since 2017, there's been many, many releases, as Anthony said, um, to kind of clean up the specs, really put all the uh, you know iterations in the specifications to make them high volume production worthy types of specifications. And we are there now, right? We have many products that are in production today. I'm gonna to talk through it in my section, but uh, we, we really think this is a robust family of specifications now. There, there will always be improvements and enhancements to the specifications. Um, uh, and then on that comment of like, okay, why are there so many different uh, form factors? Well, you'll see here today that they're actually gonna to be just a few that are gonna be really the high volume one. And there's gonna be some that are more niche, but 
as far as E1.S, uh, the first generation of products were this 5.9 millimeter form factor, which was like this 12 watt type device. Uh, this was more of like an M.2 replacement. You, you, people thought, okay, you can put these on carrier cards, you can put them in a slot. You know, you can use it like M.2, but it's better than M.2. It's got a hot pluggable connector, it's higher power, higher performance. Uh, it has two two media sites across. You can actually on M.2 you can only fit one NAND, one standard NAND package. On this you can fit two. So you basically at least double the capacity of an M.2. So it just like fixed all the problems that were wrong with M.2. Uh, but as the E1.S spec evolved, it actually evolved into these versions that actually have these enclosures on them. And this is great. This is an E1.S 25 millimeter. You can see the 15 millimeter is exactly the same, just a, a smaller uh, thin size. But this dissipates a lot more heat. You can go up to 20 to 25 watts. Uh, now this enables four and eight type terabyte class devices at full performance for PCIe Gen 4, for PCIe Gen 5. It enables storage class memory. It enables some persistent memory use cases. So the, this this form factor allows us you to scale all these different use cases in a one year. And so uh, eventually now we're gonna, as you saw, we're kind of gravitating more towards these enclosured versions because they offer the best of both worlds. It's a small form factor. You can fit a whole bunch of them in a chassis and they have a higher power envelope for uh, you know, and better signal integrity, all the other good stuff that you get with PBS Best. And so the way I think about this is E1.S is really about scalability and performance, number of drives per system. Uh, E1.L is still gonna be the capacity leadership. And so if you think about what is E1.L good at, it's a big drive. It's good for large capacity SSDs and you're gonna be maximizing the density per rack unit and you're optimizing the amount of storage you can fit into one new box. And you can do that all in a way that's serviceable, hot pluggable, and manageable. And so the, the vision for E1.L is really just around QLC, around high capacity storage. Um, the, the, way, the way I view this uh, E1.L is it's, it's just the density leader and for high capacity storage use cases. So for durable storage use cases, uh, E1.L is gonna be the best form factor for a one use, uh, one use uh, storage chassis. Uh, you heard all about E3 uh, from uh, Bill and Paul. You know, E3 is really the, the Swiss Army knife and standard form factor that's going to replace M.2 in enterprise servers. Um, you know, we think the really popular one is going to be this one on, on the right here, the uh, the one that's going to be the E3.S uh, 1T. And I, I believe I have a slide on it here in a few, but uh, that it's really small. It's like a SATO type size, and uh, it's going to be a nice mainstream form factor for enterprise servers. Uh, so this is my view of the world. Um, this is the Intel recommended design guidance, but this is really kind of how I see the world. Uh, and I talk to a lot of customers. I talk to cloud customers. I talk to enterprise server customers. I talk to OEMs. I talk to all these guys on the phone here. And this is kind of what I see the world happening. When we get to uh, you know, PCIe Gen 5, E3.S really becomes the mainstream form factor for PCIe Gen 5. If you can do PCIe Gen 5 without expensive retimers or switches, and EDSBF provides insertion loss benefit over U.2, then customers are gonna naturally gravitate towards E3. You also have the benefit of more drives, so you can do PCIe Gen 5 by two, or you can go higher power. You can go PCIe Gen 5 by four and go to these E3 thick devices where you can get up to 40 watts. And so you really have the best of both worlds on E3 for enterprise servers where you can do either more drives per chassis or higher power per drive and you get better performance. And E3 offers a huge performance benefit over uh, U.2 in the same, Kind of in the same similar kind of size. In one U servers, you saw today, there's people uh, that have you know, E3 horizontally in a one U, and they can fit 20 drives, and that's very good density in a one U. Or you could go to E1.S, which is kind of hyperscale, cloud optimized, um, you know, really high density for one U server use cases. As you saw, Jonathan showed the Lenovo use case E1.S in kind of these uh, compute nodes and you know. Um, scalable uh, CPUs. And so E1.S really just provides a ma massive amount of flexibility for one-use servers. Um, the the one in E1 stands for one U. And that's what people have to realize uh, you know, why these form factors are optimized for different segments that a one-U form factor is, is really designed for one-use server and has the best performance, best scalability, uh, and best thermals. And I mentioned for storage, really E1.L has the best capacity, has the uh, it really will give you the highest number of terabytes per rack unit in a one u storage chassis or one u server and if you're looking for density and that's all you care about then e1.l and a one u server is really the right form factor um, the really exciting part is i thought that the uh, enterprise storage use cases so for dual port storage high availability enterprise storage i thought that would stay on dual port u.2 for much longer like for two by two but um, a lot of the customers i've talked to are very excited about edsbef and as you saw in the specification, they define an actual longer version of the E3, E3.L, and that, that allows you to be able to use an E3.S or E3.L in the same chassis. 
And so if, if SSD vendors want to make a super high capacity thin SSD, uh, they can do that. They can fit a lot of IO in a storage box. So again, think of these like all flash arrays or enterprise storage arrays. You're going to see a mix of E3.S and E3.L for Gen 5. And they're really excited. All the dual core customers that I've talked to are very excited about this. Um, boot drives, you know, we're on M.2 today. Uh, hopefully we'll see, you know, you know, like 501 terabyte SSDs on E1.S kind of emerge in some point we can use it boot, but M.2 is kind of uh, the de facto standard for, for all time. Um, so this is uh, exciting data. I got permission from Greg at Forward Insights who creates the, my favorite market report, which is the Forward Insights report, uh, uh, not to knock on, on Jeff and, and the companies before, but I, I mean, Greg's got so much SSD data in this report, but, um, you know, on the left here, we have this Gen 3, Gen 4, Gen 5 transition, and you can just see how, how fast it picks up as we start picking up, um, you know, speed with new uh, versions of the servers. All, all the systems guys today has announced all their servers, you know, based on Isolake and, and AMD and PCIe Gen 4. So I, I really think it's going to be much faster than this. Um, PCIe Gen 4 instantly doubles the bandwidth for SSDs. It's a huge, huge performance benefit for SSDs, and I do not see slow adoption. I think customers are going to realize how much bandwidth they get from PCIe Gen 4 SSDs and they're going to go there. And Gen 5 is no difference. We double the bandwidth again and uh, SSD NAND dies have gotten very fast. NVMe controllers have gotten very fast. We can push the, the bounds of PCIe Gen 5 performance as well. And so I think he's got this a little undercalled as far as like how fast we move to PCIe Gen 4 and Gen 5. I think we will get there a lot faster than this. Um, the crazy thing, if you look at the graph on the right, this is just PCIe SSDs and what percentage of form factor they're on. And you can see here in 2018, these hyperscale guys on the phone here drove about 60% of the unit volume in the total NVMe SSD market to, to M.2 form factor. That's just mind blowing. These were, I think in 2018, the average capacity was like 960 gigabytes for these M.2s. You know, kind of in the near term, it's been like, you know, 916, 1920s. Um, you can see here, uh, he's got a pretty nice mix of E1.S coming, you know, kind of ramping, starting in this year and then kind of really ramping next year and into 2023 where, Eventually, we think E1.S is going to just completely overtake that M.2 volume because you heard from the guys here, the guys that are buying at exabyte scale uh, for cloud use cases are converting from M.2 to E1.S. It's a better form factor. It's ready for PCA Gen 4 and Gen 5. It's a higher capacity. It's higher power. It's higher performance. It is better than M.2 in every single way, and we will see rapid adoption of that in the data center from M.2. Um, now, I think that Greg has undercalled E3. You heard today uh, two OEMs that are very, very excited about the E3 form factor. And um, I think that it's going to pick up. And for PCIe Gen 5 specific, specifically, you know, I am counting on it being kind of the mainstream form factor for PCIe Gen 5. So uh, we, we are, we're there. I think it's going to be much more than what he has here. I think he has about 5% of, uh, you know, the units out here in 2024. So I, I think it's going to be much, big, much bigger than that. So. Again, lots of exciting stuff on EDSPF happening, and uh, um, so this is a you know just an example of you know why we need this low cost attach of NVMe. Um, I love the guys at Dell and Bill, and uh, I know the, the new servers. Uh, there's lots of new servers that are, are uh, you know much much more PCIe attached, but this is just an example of like uh, I think it's on a Dell uh, R740. You know, to get um, you know 24 NVMe drives in the front of the chassis, you need all these PCIe retimer cards. You need these slim SAS cables that cable out to the back plane. You need to have you know power supply upgrades and fan upgrades. And you know, if you're a customer and you want to use 24 NVMe drives, um, you know, and you have to pay a thousand extra dollars, that sucks. Uh, EDSF fixes that problem. Now you have a low cost attach of NVMe, and you can put the connector right on the motherboard, route cables directly to it, and you can have just low cost attach of the PCIe. Uh, that is scalable from the CPU. You can do it from a switch. If you if they're if you're long traces, you can still do retimers, but you don't have to do it uh, where you're eating up so many slots and cables and expensive cars to attach, um, you know, lots of drives. And I think everybody's really excited about that. Uh, and I mentioned E1.L. Uh, you know, I, I won't spend too much time here because we're kind of behind schedule, but uh, high capacity. It's really the density leader, and we, we see you know uh, it's really been designed for storage optimized use cases. And I mentioned that low, you know, low cost attach, you know, in a use case for these E1.L servers, you know, you have these, the drive enclosure and the LEDs and the latch are all built into the SSD. You have these back planes that are just routed to PCIe right from the uh, CPU uh, it, or through, through a switch. So it's, you know, kind of eliminates that cable mess. And you have this simplified enclosure management because you can identify drives and hot plug your drive uh, when you identify if there's a failure. So E1.L is just great for storage chassis. Uh, and then just here's some examples. I know you know, Supermicro's got one, 
This is the WeWin chassis. Uh, there's a whole lot more that I've seen um, very recently. I wish, you know, the, Intel, the, the new Intel one that's coming out is being announced in like two days. and I, I didn't get permission to show it uh, today, but uh, just check the Intel website for the Intel servers here in a couple of days. There's some really cool chassis that we're going to be releasing with the um, uh, Intel Xeon Scalable Processor 3rd Gen, so uh, isolate. Uh, so uh, I'm very, very excited about our new chassis that support uh, Gen 4. So uh, you wanted us, we covered this, um, you know, the reason why we have different heat sinks and enclosures is to scale the power and performance and thermal uh, and it really just dictates how many drives we put in a chassis. I've shown this slide many times before. This graph is you know, directly from the actual specification. So um, this is a mechanical study that I got from the Intel data center team, but it just kind of shows you know, the capabilities of E1.S for being a performance scalable solution. So you can do 32 E1.S 9.5 millimeters in a 1U chassis, or you can do 25, I'm sorry, 24 of these E1.S 15 millimeters in a 1U chassis, or you can do 16 of the um, E1.S 25 millimeters. So it really offers the, the best of both worlds. If you want to do a ton of drives, you can do that. If you want to do a medium amount of drives, you can do that. If you want to do a chassis where you just do like eight drives on one side and then OCP NICs on the other or something, you can do that. It just offers a lot of flexibility and you can do eight drives only taking up a third of, you know, of the space on, on the one you chassis. And this is much better and much better airflow than you got to in you know in one u chassis where they have to put be put horizontally and have a back plane and, and blocking some of the airflow and uh yes uh, bill talked a lot about e3 and i know um if you guys want to learn more about this I, I definitely urge you to go check out the webcast we did on snea where uh bill and paul and go in uh, very in depth about e3 and about uh, the different variants but i'll just be real, be real short this uh green one here this is the e3.s this is the standard 7.5 millimeter uh, enclosure this is going to be your Swiss Army knife for Gen 5 SSDs. This will be like you know, kind of two, four, eight terabyte class drives. It's really small. It's 7.5 millimeters thick. It looks like a SATA drive. It's just like a, a SATA drive that happens to be super fast. It's going to be have a connector that's ready for Gen 4 and Gen 5, uh, and it supports 25 watts. So you can get U.2 performance in half the size. And uh, what Bill was talking about with the scalability, this really enables uh, you know scalable solutions for uh, EDSF. Now, the one thing we didn't touch on was the thin and thick are actually compatible in chassis. You can make a backplane that's compatible, uh, that you know, is mechanically and electrically compatible with both. You can just put a tick in uh, the 2T and that'll just fill up two slots or you can put uh, you know, two 1T uh, devices in there. And so this is really allows the flexibility for a number of scaling the number of drives or scaling higher power, higher performance drives. You know, if you wanted to in the future have storage cost memory or CSL or any kind of thing like that, you can do that. And uh, it's gonna be very, very, Awesome. Uh, and here's the, the Intel mechanical studies. I know the spec has some slightly different numbers in here. You know, it shows you can do up to 48 devices in a actual 2U if you you know, smash the drives in there. Uh, now, you know, our customers are really going to put, you know, 48, uh, you know, PCIe Gen 5 by 4 drives in, in a 2U chassis. Maybe. Well, the spec allows it if you want to get that high and if you have the thermal capability to cool it, maybe you can do that. Uh, you know, I think we'll probably see 24 to 32 drives be, you know, kind of more standard, but Again, uh, as, as Bill said, you can kind of mix and match the uh, E3.S uh, uh, 2T, which is the thick, and the 1T, which is the, the short and the thin. And it's very, very cool. And again, the, the E3 is a very scalable solution, not just for 2Us, uh, but for 1Us as well. You can put it horizontally and fit 20 in a 1U, and now you have double the capacity and double the IOPS and double the performance of U.2 in a same type of enclosure. And so this is why E3 is going to be the replacement for U.2. And uh, again, you heard from all the gentlemen on the call today that uh we are very excited about making this happen in the future so with that uh that was kind of a quick overview uh i'm going to um i know i'm, I'm talking very fast so <laughs> so i know we're behind schedule so uh you're gonna hear from me about uh, intel's edsf products and our uh, nvme ssds and server platforms and then uh you're gonna hear from uh, a lot of these other ssd vendors uh, who are actively engaged in the ocp ecosystem then I'll show you their awesome products as well. So uh, we mentioned um, you know, the cloud spec. Uh, I'm not going to go. Ross already gave you kind of an overview of what's what's in there, but the 2.0 spec is here, and there's a draft. You guys should check it out. There's um, basically has everything you could possibly want to know about how to build an OCP NVMe SSD. Um, my favorite part of the actual whole spec actually is this smart log page. I did an entire presentation at Flash Memory Summit last year, which was monitoring the health of NVMe SSDs, and I highlighted you know, why I think this is a great idea 
I've always wanted deeper telemetry on the drives to be able to actually figure out what's going on and do predictive analytics and AI machine learning on failures and predictive failure analysis. And these types of log pages allow customers to actually go dig much, much deeper into what's going on under the hood of the SSD. Uh, if things are going wrong, to be able to find out what uh, what's wrong with the drive. So uh, this is my favorite part of the entire spec. Uh, so bravo to you guys. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Ross. Hi. Hi, 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 everybody. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Malik Sompura. Um, thank you for attending this session. Um, I lead the data center SSD product planning and management uh, at Kioxia. Um, so I'd like to give a special shout out to Ross and team for, you know, this whole committee for hurting us here. We need these events to gather and discuss ideas to bring the industry together, especially in these uh, trying times. Um, so I also, I'm actually glad to be here. I've had the privilege to work with most of uh, the presenters, uh, very respected industry veterans here. Uh, in some capacity, I've collaborated with them. I've worked with them some in, you know, uh, at, at length. Um, so it's uh, great to be here. Thank you. Um, next slide, Ross. So um, I'm, I've strictly followed the script from Ross, like have, you know, we have limited time. Um, focus on two slides. So um, obviously, uh, Kioxia, uh, uh, I represent Kioxia Americas and uh, Kioxia is an amalgamation of two words, if you don't know, because, um, you know, after Toshiba's uh, parent company, we separated and we've, um, you know, we have been independent for a, over a year now. And uh, Kyoku, it, it is an amalgamation of two words, Kyoku, which means uh, memory in Jap Japanese and Greek word axia, which means value. So we strive to provide value to our customers through our flash memory products. Similarly, OCP strives to uh, provide value to its members through this uh, collaboration, such as these events, uh, which are extremely helpful. I, um, uh, you know, I really, uh, we really dig this. Um, basically, Kioxia has had long-term relationship with the with the partners, um, with the OCP authors, you know, lead authors. We've been collaborating for a long time, and uh, you know, we actively participated in this uh, for, since the inception. Now, as a as a flash vendor, um, we you know come across just like John Michaels. Um, talked about talking to all the customers, um, hyperscale uh, hyperscale data center and enterprise customers. We learn a lot from our customers, you know, about reliability, thermals, um, smart, um, you know, everything, security and features. And we go on to basically understanding, we learn from them on, on what applications, uh, you know, why the SSD, what capacity, why, what form factor, what are the thermal constraints, things like that. So this was our time for giving back and um, we actually actively participated, provided a lot of feedback to the to the spec uh, from the beginning. And, uh, you know, from a vendor's point of view, a lot of times uh, we have a different point of view than the user, because um, sometimes it's not clear on the specification on how SSD should behave or what how should it be implemented a certain spec. So we, I think, uh, by giving that, uh, it gives everybody from a vendor point of view also, it makes it very clear and also it helps uh, the users also. So um, uh, we definitely, you know, uh, were our participants of the OCP right from the beginning and we really appreciate the effort overall. On the EDSFF, which uh, we've covered, I think we've covered a lot of sessions on EDSFF uh, in the, the last few minutes. Um, we are we are also active participants of the SNIA SFF org, um, which was previously uh, and also in previously in EDSFF consortium. EDSFF is gaining a lot of traction, as you saw, you heard uh, Paul and Biddle and uh, Jonathan talk about it, John Michaels talking about it. So um, we are actively listening. Um, we we are actually. Uh, we have plans for a lot of form factors. Um, today, I will only focus on E1.S though. Uh, here, the as as they say, you know, the proof is in the pudding. So, Kioxia announced industry's first PCI Gen 4 SSD uh, last year using OC, uh, OCP NVMe SSD specification. So, um, you know, we we definitely. Um, 
you know, and and it happened to be an even dot s uh, drive as well. So uh, you know, we I, I'll show some uh, another in the next slide. I will show the the product, but. You know, overall with EDSFF, OCP, and uh, Kioxia's partnership, um, the the specification that you know we have general, you know, which has a general standard cre uh, which create uh, created by this specification, it, it is uh, as I think a lot of people talked about it earlier. Also, it, it creates this. Uh, you know, base specification that can benefit everybody, right? It helps the ecosystem overall. So opportunistically, we we try and promote that OCP specification to specific customers who who may not have um, published specs. They may have their own specs, but not either well written. Um, sometimes, um, you know, we we spend months or weeks. Uh, talking in, in negotiations come to only find out that it's not very different from what others others want. So so this actually kind of creates that playing field. Um, so we tr truly believe that industry alignment on product requirement is a win-win overall. It takes the guess away, guesswork away, you know, reduces the back and forth with the customers, um, you know, faster time to market. Uh, okay, uh, next, next slide, please. So um, this, uh, I was talking about the, um, the the product that we announced. On the left side, you can see um, we have the 25 millimeter, 18 millimeter, and the 9.5 millimeter, all forms of the even dot S. Um, this product is called XT6. Um, this was designed. up uh, with uh, in mind so it was purpose-built um, lots of uh, consideration went in a long time uh, for you know coming together all of this coming together as well um, OCP NVMe SSD design um, basically we followed that uh, it you know obviously meets the form factor performance thermals uh, enables the customers to take advantage of economies of scale as you know make, makes it very standard we can you know ship them ship them in uh, in, in uh, at scale, uh, the one of the other things we learned was that uh, you know obviously we have been shipping all other form factors, different interfaces, uh, you know SAS, SATA, you know in all segments also. So uh, consistent performance, latency, and reliability in a 24/7 uh, data center required a few unique things um, that we needed to tweak, um, whether it was SOC or also in firmware. So, so uh, we've produced a very high quality product uh, in the specification table, as you can uh, see, it's a 3D TLC Bix flash from uh, Kioxia. Uh, the interface is Gen 4 and you can see the speeds and feeds. Uh, uh, it's in two terabyte and four terabyte capacity. Um, we have sequential reads going up to 6,500, um, you know, this is, Obviously, we we uh, do reach higher those higher than these numbers, but these are the allowed, uh, uh, you know, numbers to uh, um, to be published. But um, so you can see the um, you know four terabyte going up to 2400 on the sequential writes. Random reads are up to 850, and random writes are up to 90k. Um, okay. Um, I wanted to leave with the with a quote. Um, uh, so bear in mind, bear in mind, it's a long one. Developing and uh, de developing and deploying flash-based products is very challenging. EDSFF E1.S is the next generation of the flash form factors with its superior thermals, performance, serviceability, and scalability compared to solutions today. In addition to this, the OCP-based NVMe cloud specification is a great step forward for aligning the SSD providers with hyperscale needs. XT6 support of these next gen flash needs uh, is a great step forward for meeting hyperscale needs for now and the future, Ross. <laughs> so with that, I'll end my presentation. Thank you. I, I'll be happy to answer any questions later. Ross, uh, please take it away. Good, or good morning, I guess. Good afternoon to those of you who are in the mountain or east of here. Uh, my name is Eric Pike. I'm the Senior Director of the Cloud Segment Marketing at Western Digital. Um, like everybody else, I'll spend a couple of quick minutes talking about 
you know, the EDSFF form factor and, and obviously the, the very compelling uh, advantages of, of having a common spec that we all need. Um, let me just say at the intro here, and I'll talk a little bit about more on the next slide, that the amount of change that our industry is dealing with today, I think everybody feels this, right? It, it's, it, it's amazing. It's, that creates both certainly an exciting time for those of us who have been around the storage industry and flash and semiconductors, uh, but it also creates a lot of consternation as we all try to navigate all of this change. And um, in that context, you know, WD has continued to support uh, many of our key customers with you know, these new technologies. And so the products we have today are both, you know, what you're going to see is a, a storage centric solution uh, centered around the E1L family of products, which um, I think, you know, again, some of the people earlier today talked about, we talked about this a little bit where, you know, you're really talking about the most density optics in a, in a large rack. Um, this gives you the chance to get access to those last you can possibly get, uh, you know, within uh, the smallest form factor at a system. One you optimized, uh, very power efficient and TCO centric uh, opportunities with respect to getting a, a, up to today, up to a half petabyte in a one U, uh, soon uh, up to a petabyte inside of a one U. Uh, the, the other family of product or the other two product associated with is the E1S. Uh, the E1S now is gonna be more of a compute centric solution. Uh, Ross talked a little bit more about this and I think John Michael as well, in that now you're really focused on you know, the, the access density, right? How do you get the optimal amount of access density to flash? And, and really flash, as we all know, right, kind of changed the paradigm of, of storage access and storage capability. And with these EDSFF form factors comes the ability to unlock that full potential. Um, so today, these are the products that WD has uh, made available to our customers and continues to work and create innovation around. Uh, and obviously the solutions Again, as many of our industry compatriots have talked about today, of really optimizing for for the density, the thermals, you know, performance scalability. Um, we'll go ahead and go to the next slide. So, you know, with all of that navigation and all of that change and all of these things, obviously having an industry consortium where we can all come together, vet some of these solutions, um, and obviously, you know, again, I think some of uh, again, the industry compatriots have said that earlier today, where we welcome those of you who are not yet part of this community uh, to join the community. Um, you know, the ability for us to settle out and navigate this world of change, which again, world of opportunity and change comes hand in hand, uh, you know, to, to be part of this uh, standardization setting uh, such that certainly we as suppliers and also you as a customer can figure out how do we find the the right handshakes to, to deliver and unleash the capability of, of, of these new technologies. Um, with that said, I'll, I'll go ahead and move on to the next. Okay, uh, thanks Eric. Um, so my name is Young Fadak. I'm a senior director in product planning at uh, Samsung, and I wanted to go over uh, our uh, our offerings in in this space. Uh, the truth is, uh, there's a lot of stuff that we've already covered. I don't want to rehash um, all of that technology. No, go back uh, one more. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. Which one are we? We go back to the slide 37 there. So uh, basically what, what uh, I kind of wanted to stress is that Samsung has a, a number of different product offerings in EDSFF today. Uh, and there are two different areas that we should cover here. Number one is of course the form factor. So let, let's go over that first. Um, and in, in that form factor, we actually have two different versions that we've uh, already uh, started to, to, to uh, productize. Uh, and those are the PM9 Alpha 3 and the PM1743. Uh, both of them are based on our version, our V6 TLC uh, technology. Uh, the major difference between these two are, uh, number one, the, the form factor. 
the PM9 alpha-3 will be what we use to support the E1S and E1L corn factors. And the, um, the, the uh, PM1743 will support E3, and that will be dual ported. Um, so these are the two major uh, products that we have today. The PM9 alpha-3 is actually available now, so you can order these today in, uh, in different um, capacities. We'll take a look at those in a second. Uh, and, we, you know, like most of the people here, we do believe that there is a shift from M.2 to E1S. Uh, in the E3 uh, form factor, we're taking a look at something that's a bit bigger. Again, this does support dual port. Uh, we believe that this will take us to, to Gen 5 speeds uh, relatively uh, easily. And in Q2, we should go ahead and, and be able to start taking orders on those uh, at, at that point. Uh, the other part of this, of course, is the standardization around the firmware. So if we go to the next slide, uh, one of the things that uh, Samsung has done a lot of is talk with our customers about what kind of firmware uh, features are needed, make sure that uh, we, we adhere to them all. And of course, uh, we here are all already aware that there's a lot of this around health monitoring, reliability, and security. And so we're going to be putting all those features in. Uh, there are a number of different uh, form factors and capacities. Uh, so these all uh, do support the OCP version one. Uh, we are looking for a certification for the next versions as, as those do come out. Uh, so, so stay tuned for that. Uh, and with that, we, we have uh, on E1S, we can support one to eight terabytes in capacity. Uh, what I think is interesting is that while a lot of people look at the top end eight terabyte, there are people who do say, you know, I do want lower uh, capacity. And it's because they want a different ratio of storage to CPU. Uh, for E1L today, we're supporting 16 terabyte. Uh, and then uh, the, the legacy form factors will leave out of this. But uh, that, that's what Samsung has. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Young. Um, shifting over to Micron, my name is Roger Peen. I'm the vice president and general manager of Micron's data center storage group focusing on SSDs. You know, first of all, I'd actually like to congratulate OCP for its 10-year anniversary, which I believe is this month. Um, I remember when OCP was announced in April of 2011 in Palo Alto, and it's amazing to witness the progress that's been made and the industry support to develop open standard solutions. So I'm pleased to really um, be here and be supportive of OCP. You know, looking at the specific market opportunity, there's a, tre a tremendous amount of growth with about 28 billion spend in compute-based OCP platforms growing at a compounded annual growth rate of over 16% through the forecast time horizon till 2024. And in the storage segment, it's even faster growth at 18.5% to greater than 5 billion in the same time horizon. And I'm referencing a CIO and leader newsletter, which is using uh, Jeff's IDC data, who was online earlier today. You know, here at Micron, we believe OCP is very aligned with our values for our memory and storage solutions, specifically in the areas of acceleration catalysts, efficiency, and open industry standards. You know, just like OCP, Micron provides some reference architectures to help enable end user solutions. Um, and it's critical that these architectures are standards-based that demonstrate interoperability between all of its core components. You know, by doing so, you know, we believe that solutions can be released into production environments faster and easier in a more efficient manner. And it's critical that as an industry, we continuously work together to improve the velocity of when new technologies are developed and the realization of the benefits in a production environment. I mean, that's ultimately the goal. And instead of seeing you know, new form factors get launched and we wait two, three, four, five years, it would be really ideal if we could start to shorten those, those time windows such that when new products are launched and released in the market, they could be deployed into production environments in a relatively short um, time window. You know, secondly is our focus on efficiency. Uh, Micron, as a global semiconductor manufacturer, uh, we are absolutely focused on sustainability, which is kind of appropriate given that Earth Day was just last week. You know, Micron has a program called Fast Forward, where we'll spend roughly a billion dollars over the next five to seven years to focus 
on operational goals for things like energy emissions, water waste. And for the first time, we were listed on the Dow Jones Sustainability Index. You know, these are the same challenges that today's data centers are faced with, with, you know, never ending pursuit to continuously improve their carbon footprints. And, you know, to realize those benefits, you know, companies and data centers started a long time ago, and it comes down to the fundamental building blocks like SSDs. And optimizing a single SSD is not the same as optimizing a data center due to the deployment of thousands and thousands of SSDs. You know, for example, power is where we generally try and fit within a power envelope within an SSD. And that's fine for a single SSD in a small configuration, but if we have just one watt difference in idle power, it's not very meaningful at that SSD, but when you get that multiplication factor in a large scale data center, that's when it can translate into kilowatts of extra power usage. So designing storage solutions for scalability is critical, and it's a new way to view not just the development of SSDs, but all the, the building block components. And finally, um, Micron is all about open standards, like many of you on the phone today, which is what OCP is all about. Micron as a memory storage solutions provider must align to those standards, and we encourage this. Um, and in the past, we've done things like, uh, you know, we, we developed a uh, heterogeneous storage engine um, which is a software stack that optimizes the use of data access to different tiers of memory and storage in the hierarchy. And you know, rather than try and monetize it or productize it, we had decided to release that engine into the open source Linux community. So on this front, I think Micron's very aligned with uh, OCP. Next slide. Now, like everyone else on the phone, the the number of form factors that must be supported is actually a very significant challenge, not only for Micron, but all the SSD manufacturers. You know, not only do we have the different form factors such as, you know, two and a half inch in different sizes, seven millimeter, 15 millimeter, M.2 in different lengths, and all the EDSFF for, uh, variants. But when we combine these form factors with other attributes such as the different capacity points, um, different endurance levels, and security capabilities, the SKU matrix grows exponentially and very quickly becomes unsustainable. You know, this is especially true from a manufacturing perspective in an industry where we as a group need to have supply chain flexibility, especially in an environment when NAND might be at a shortage. And having all these different variants and trying to manage that from a supply chain perspective becomes very, very complex. So I'm a big fan of getting off legacy form factors. And you know, I was pleased to hear Lee say earlier today that uh, they're looking at moving away from M.2, except for some boot usages, and moving on to the new EDSFF form factors. And so is Micron. So Moving away from legacy form factors that were predominantly designed for hard drives and moved towards form factors that are optimized for NAND flash is the right direction. We're very supportive of that. And we see you know, E1S as the really the first large deployment that's here now will continue to grow over the next couple of years as identified in the chart. And then we see some E1L for large capacities. Um, we are aligning that particular form factor with our QLC technology. And then longer term, I believe Micron is aligned with uh, pretty much everybody else online today that we see a transition to E.3 or E3 aligned with the PCIe Gen 5 that'll be deployed en masse within the next couple of years. And so bottom line, we're very committed to developing our storage solutions based upon the latest OCP specs. Um, and we will be offering new solutions in not just the current EDSF of form factors, but the future E3 uh, form factors uh, in the future. So thank you very much, and I'll pass it off to the next speaker. Thank you, Roger. Um, I think you can hear me well. Um, uh, 
Hello, everyone. My name is Eric Cheng I'm from SK Hynix. Um, I'm from senior, um, uh, I'm from then technical marketing. Um, so I'd like to talk about a little bit of pack of ways that uh, while we implement the um, um, data center environment such as back in EDSFF. So everyone else talked about the benefit and advantages of the new open uh, spec and EDSFF. And since we are um, developing product and start to offer the product to the customer and we're shipping the product, so we'd like to share some takeaways while we're doing it. And then there's a little bit of um, um, improvement we can we can uh, expect from, from now on, right? So uh, by leveraging data center and VMS as this spec, um, we we are able to provide um, the SSD to the variety of customer who does who don't have specific SSD requirement. Although there's the NVMe SSD uh, protocol spec out there that has lots of flexibility, so that customer can choose multi different configuration and options. So probably there might um, there might be more kind of customer who has different flavor and then taste. Uh, the spec and configuration for the SSD. So as we, we uh, leverage NVMe SSD, data center NVMe SSD spec um, that allows us to provide uh, the same common the SSD platform to multiple customers by using the same product. So that's the main benefit out of it. So that that's what we illustrate the uh, the change or difference between without data center NVMe SSD spec and with data center uh, NVMe SSD spec. So we can share a more common platform to provide the pro per product to the multiple customers. That's the one big benefit. Of. And also we like to highlight that um, there's a security requirement becomes more clear and robust. So uh, there is a one challenging that actually we, we had before is to collect the right uh, security requirement from the multiple customers because they are referring to many uh, different uh, standards and requirements on the security type of thing. And then security requirements is getting more important and important and they're having more, they like to uh, keep adding more requirements to the security stuff. So we've wanted to find some common ground to, to be referenced so that we can make uh, uh, SSD out of it. So. This data center and VMS spec is the one that we can um, basically reference for the security requirement. So that's the kind of big um, benefit or advantage or advantage that we can take um, from this spec. Uh, but still, uh, while we are taking um, this spec uh, into the product and then engage, start to engage with more customers, we found some challenges still. So we like to improve going forward. So. Uh, although there's a device configuration, device profiles still defined in the spec with a small table, uh, when we have more time to discuss with the customers, we found there's still unused features still defined as a uh, mandatory. So that this may add more burdens to suppliers like us when we implement the firmware. So that might be uh, another thing we can improve over time probably that can uh, be resolved, I believe, but that's still that's something that we'd like to discuss going forward. And also um, this spec, the data center and family spec grew so fast. As they grew so fast, um, adding new features kept at, uh, uh, new, new features kept added um, with a very quite frequently and then new spec kept um, released. So we like to manage the frequency or cadence between specs to make it more predictable, um, then we can definitely manage our product um, release plan um, based on the cadence as well. So I know understand that since it's open standard, so we cannot kind of the manage uh, um, the release time though, but this is kind of something we can discuss or think about in the next next few uh, release, I think. So next next slide, please. All right, so uh, from this point, I'd like to talk about um, the products we are offering now. So we are offering now E1.S and E1.Air product to the customers now. Um, and then those are based on um, OC data center and VME spec version 1.0 and 1.0A. And then next product is targeting to support data center and VME spec version two as well. So as we have a E1.S, E1.L as a major product from 
from this point for the customer uh, for dot edsff we see the lots of advantages of eon.s or eon.l product by replacing some existing uh, form factor so we see eon.s product is really uh, came in the right timing and right place because m.2 was the target to be replaced by eon.s but m.2 couldn't um, go up to pchm4 and high uh, high power envelope and it doesn't support in hot plug capability. So when there's cost users to um, use M.2, if they want to um, have a high performance SSD, then at UN.S was the right product to replace that uh, demand. And also there is another user who look for the high capacity and that we are offering uh, UN.L to meet that requirement. Although we repurpose, repurpose the same ASIC and product from uh, E1.S to E1.L for the high capacity so that we kind of downgrade the interface um, um, to PCI Gen 3. Um, so E1.L still kind of support the high capacity uh, with the um, good performance based on PCI Gen 3, although that's still capable of Gen 4 internally. So we are having two different stream lanes to support two different um, demands and uh, requirements in the market. So moving forward, PCI Gen 4, as everyone else said that E3 uh, may be the right place to uh, be supported with a PCI Gen 5. So that's our that's on our list, and then that will be supported from PCI Gen uh, 5 era. So I believe um, by combining uh, OCP uh, data center and VMI SSD spec and e EDSF form factor comes into the same place in the one place, and then there will gonna be um, trigger a new adoption of the SSD in the market with a different chassis and different type of um, use cases. That's pretty much of uh, my presentation. Thank you for listening. Hello, I hope you can hear me. My name's Anu. Uh, I'm VP of Marketing for Padu uh, Technology. We're the smallest Korean company and the latest entrance to the SSD market. Uh, our company first started up on the principle, we kind of recognize a problem that's associated with uh, heat and dissipating heat from the box. So we created an SSD, which has basically got the lowest power footprint. And it gives you for a given terabyte or power envelope, it gives you the highest IOPS because of our design. And we also focus very much at, you know, keeping the QoS very steady even though we increase the performance to higher and higher notes. So that was our claim to fame. So when Ross and Lee first came out with, you know, standardizing the E1S heatsink form factors across the industry, we welcomed it because it's sort of recognition of the problem we'd been working on and that we'd successfully solved. Uh, <clears throat> we were pretty happy when Ross came out with, uh, when uh, the OCP, guys came out with the OCP Cloud SSD specification. So we're a startup and we'd like to service as many customers as possible and uh, you know try to meet all their requirements. So the thing that the OCP uh, specification did for us, it separated what's common from what's not common between the various vendors as well as their um, workloads. So it made it easier for us to design and target the specific customers that we wanted to target with the specification. Uh, so as soon as we saw it, we sort of adopted it and we made our SS, we made the earliest SSDs with our Gen 3 uh, with the heat sinks and we uh, demonstrated them at um, the OCB show last year, which was online in April. Uh, we actually had a live demo with a super, super micro box and we could see that, you know, uh, we could see that even for a small SSD, uh, which was designed, uh, with a very efficient footprint, just putting it with, you know, just putting it in that form factor and putting it in the super micro gave us better advantage in terms of performance. Uh, <clears throat> so now we're pretty happy that uh, in November 2020, basically we announced, uh, we productized our Gen 3 E1S SSDs and we announced the world's first um, Gen 4 E1S SSDs. Uh, we were pretty happy that HP and Dell came to join the specification. So now, you know, we have fewer form factors to address and we can focus our efforts on optimizing those for a good performance. And we're pretty excited about the boot drug specification. 
Uh, so today where we are is we have Gen 3 OCP SSDs, which are mass produced. And uh, Gen 4 SSDs, we have working samples available. Next slide, please, Ross. Yeah. So uh, basically, uh, you know, uh, we have SSDs that are available today. You can come and talk to us and we're able to give you samples. Uh, of our SSDs on a Gen 3 by 4, basically we show a sequential read of 3,500 megabytes per second and a sequential write of 2,700 megabytes per second, a random read of 800 KIOPS and a random write of 100 KIOPS. Uh, yeah. And uh, on our Gen 4, we show a sequential read of 7,300 megabytes per second a sequential write of 4,600 megabytes per second, random read of 1,490 random write, uh, random read KI ops, and 180 KI ops of random write. Now on Gen 5, we continue this performance going forward, so come talk to us about it. I think that what you will notice about Fabu is that we're not super high on advertising our performance or anything like that. The, what you would like, what we would like to do is just give you samples and, you know, a lot of you in the audiences have our samples and have tried them out. We like to do and show and show and tell rather than talk a lot. So please come to me if you're interested in trying out our samples. We have even our samples available for Gen 4x4 and they work very well. Uh, we really like the standard because it enables us to focus on what we're good at which is optimizing the performance for a given power envelope. And standardizing it basically really helps us out in a big way in that we are now on level playing field with a lot of big guys, which you know we probably wouldn't have a chance to compete with if not for the standardization. Thanks, Russ. I'm done. Hey, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Adam Guy. I'm from Microsoft Senior Hardware Engineering Manager, and my team is responsible for device level validation for any storage device that goes into the Azure cloud. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about the validation piece of OCP, and uh, we'll have inputs here from UNHIOL and uh, Teledyne Lacroix. So, you know, I won't beat this up too much. Um, we got a good synopsis from both Ross and Paul on the benefits of the data center NVMe SSD spec. As you can see here, this is illustrating the consolidation of that wide array of, of requirements and the alignment that we have across data center and OEM customers on, on that set of requirements. And of course, that yields many benefits. Um, from the data center side, it gives us a common and deterministic SS, SSD functionality in system, regardless of where the SSD comes from. And from an SSD supplier standpoint, uh, you know you get many, you get numerous data center opportunities from one leveraged SSD design. You can leverage the same firmware um, across multiple different customers. So the next slide is going to show how we're addressing validation. Uh, there's been a lot of questions from SSD suppliers on on what we're doing about testing against the OCP requirements, and currently we have a the initial test suite. Uh, intercepting OCP revision 1.0a in progress. Um, that, of course, will evolve um, and intercept the 2.0 revision with the addition of HP and Dell EMC in the future. Uh, but our first intercept here is OCP 1.0a. Um, the way that this process is working today is outlined in this very high level flow chart at the bottom. Uh, we take the, the OCP specification that feeds into the Azure storage test specification team that I manage at Microsoft. And our output is uh, a set of test procedural documents or test specifications um, that are then provided externally. And today we've partnered thus far with Teledyne LaCroix and UNH IOL. Um, I'll note that those test specifications, there's those that are familiar with the, with the OCP specification, there's a wide array of, of requirements in there. These test specs are focused specifically on black box requirements. Anything that requires uh, custom firmware hooks, air injection capabilities um, that aren't available in a black, black box environment, we aren't writing test specs for those. And we'll be working with the suppliers on uh, how we verify compliance with those requirements. Um, outside of that, everything else will be covered in these test procedural docs. 
Those are currently being reviewed with the stakeholders that put together the spec. So we sign off with Facebook, um, UNH, and, and Teledyne LaCroix. And UNH and Teledyne each get respectively the resulting test spec from those reviews. And they are working independently on, on their own test suites. And with that, we will transition uh, first to Teledyne and then to UNH Iowa. Good afternoon, good morning. You guys, let me get my camera on here. All right. So, uh, you know, good morning, good afternoon. My name is Nick Kritzke. I'm Senior Director for Teledyne LaCroix. I'm responsible for managing uh, storage, networking, testing, training, products and services that uh, are offered through Teledyne LaCroix, and that includes uh, our Austin Labs team. Uh, as Ross mentioned early on in this whole thing, it's great to be part of this friends and family of storage event. It's uh, hard to believe, you know, it's been over a year since most of us have been together. But, uh, you know, it's exciting to see the industry coming back together, coming back to life with new opportunities for tester measurement. As you guys know, testing and conformance, it's an important part of making sure that devices are able to interoperate, interoperate and perform well in the data center. So, you know, Teledyne LaCroix has been industry leader for a lot of this uh, NVMe, PCIe compliance for many years. We're excited to be part of uh, what's going on with the OCP team, the uh, being come, becoming an industry partner with them for testing. Um, Teledyne and Recroy includes Austin Labs and Oakgate Technologies. Uh, both, of a, both teams kind of provide an array of solutions to our customers that you know, are beneficial for testing OCP SSDs and NVMe devices from early design through production to field support. Um, there are many tools that are gonna be required uh, to support the OCP uh, specification. Uh, a lot of that starts with our protocol analyzers and exercisers and then moves into uh, different products for doing performance and benchmarking and then uh, moves into you know things for NVMe SSD-based functionality. And then the, the Oakgate SSD test platform with SVS Pro and Enduro uh, will be the platform that you know, we'll be using to implement a wide range of the tests required for the uh, data center SSD specification. For those of you guys who don't know, so Austin Labs is the services organization for Teledyne LaCroix. We provide a critical piece of the puzzle when it comes to test and validation. We provide third-party testing as a service with full automation for protocol compliance suites. Uh, we're already working with a, a large number of the uh, people that have spoken earlier today for uh, some of the early adoption of the OCP uh, compliance specifications uh, and getting things moving forward as quickly as possible on, on those uh, specs. Next page. So, you know, as, as Adam kind of mentioned, we're working on implementing the test procedures for the data center NVMe SSD specification. We wanna make sure that, you know, target devices comply with a wide array of requirements for the data center. The test specification takes advantage of, you know, this, what is being put into the spec and what is being jointly reviewed with Microsoft and the OCP group in order to create these individual test cases. Um, from a high level, uh, the test spec's been broken up into you know, about eight different sections. Each of the tests are being developed uh, you know, for these different sections. In those eight sections is you know, dozens of individual test cases that are going to be implemented. And those are being implemented on the Oakgate platform for complete automation of the testing. And it covers things like PCIe testing for base functionality, uh, boot requirements, PCIe resets, moves into NVMe, which focuses more on the controller configuration, and then big things, smart cloud health, uh, security, make sure secure boot works and other security features, performance. You know, there's OCP workload specifications and benchmarkings that need to be covered. And then power and thermal requirements, reliability, device stability, telemetry, and then the wide array of form factor testing, hot swap, power management, and all the different form factors. So from, you know, the role that we're playing is, you know, we're, we're helping to implement things, uh, get them off the ground, get things moving quickly, uh, creating a simple solution in order to be able to allow the storage industry to quickly qualify and uh, allow for repeatable, measurable testing. 
along with the software for the OCP data center SSD testing, which will be part, you know, as I mentioned on the Oakgate platform, the software side of it, the Austin Labs piece uh, has set up a fully functional third-party test lab to support the testing of this. And our goal is really just to make things as easy as possible for people to be able to test and adopt this specification and get products out to the field as quickly as they can. Um, and if there's you know, any support that's required or needed, you know, we're here to help. That uh, covers my slides. All right, hello everyone. I'm David Bull from University of New Hampshire Interoperability Lab. And uh, I'm gonna just talk a little bit about the things we've been doing at UNH IOL to prepare for data center SSD compliance testing. Um, if you're not familiar with us at University of New Hampshire, uh, we have a wide variety of compliance and interop services for the data center community from ethernet networking, module and cable testing, and of course, uh, NVMe SSD testing uh, that we're gonna talk about today. And so for us, uh, you know, when we first heard about the data center SSD spec uh, making its way through uh, OCP, when we first heard about that from Ross, we could see very quickly that this aligned very well with some of the other uh, services that we provide to the community, especially with respect to uh, NVMe compliance. And so I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, in order to support this effort, uh, we published a data center S SSD test plan in July 2020. We made it public. It's up there on our website. You can go look at it. Um, anytime you want. And in that test plan, we really focused on the NVMe aspects of the data center SSD spec. Uh, and since we've published that, we've been having regular engagements with some of the key stakeholders here, Adam alluded to that, uh, to refine and expand and upgrade our test plans, make sure that it's meeting the community needs. And, and like I said, that's public. You can go and see exactly what we're doing uh, in our test plan. We're happy to field questions and, and feedback on that. Now, uh, one important thing to note about the data center SSD spec is that practically on page one of the specification, it talks about compliance to the NVMe 1.4 specification. And this is a place where we believe that UNH IOL is uniquely positioned to support the community. Obviously, we've been working very closely with the NVMe organization uh, over the last decade on compliance for NVMe, and we provide services and tools to support that. And so we've actually been able to integrate our data center SSD compliance tests as an add-on right alongside our NVMe 1.4 compliance test. So we have all those tests together in a single tool, which will really speed up uh, the validation process, make it real easy for anyone. Uh, and the tool itself is very portable. A lot of folks on the, on the call today are using that tool for NVMe compliance already. Um, and it runs on pretty much any kind of desktop system uh, just to help keep costs, costs down. Well, let's move to the next slide. We'll take a closer look at uh, our data center SSD compliance tools. Uh, the test cases we use draw directly from the data center SSD spec. Uh, so if you looked at that spec, you'll see all the requirements have kind of a name number code and our test plan and the tool uses those directly. So you can make a clear line from the tool uh, and the log that the test is producing right into the data center SSD spec to see what requirement uh, is being checked. Uh, I'm happy to say that these tests and this tool is already being demonstrated right now at customer sites. We have companies that are running these tests on uh, data center SSD drives, providing feedback. Uh, you can see the screenshot here of, of that tool in action. And uh, throughout 2021, we're going to be ramping up our test services and tools around data center SSDs, uh, trying to get full coverage of that spec. One other thing to note. Uh, there's a lot of talk on the call today about form factors around uh, EDSFF and so forth. Um, one of the other things that we're providing at UNH IOL is uh, test fixtures for that. So OCP NIC slash EDSFF uh, test fixtures, we do have those available if you're trying to look to do uh, PCIe validation and validate electrical signaling on any of these uh, new uh, form factors. So again, excited to be supporting uh, all the work that's gone into the data center SSD spec. Excited to see what's coming down the pipe and happy to support the community. So thank you again. Okay. Um, well, um, I think I, we're at the end of the presentations and normally I would go into uh, kind of a Q&A here because we did have a good number of questions. Thank you all for uh, sending them in. But of course, uh, given that we are uh, a bit over our allotted time, 
Uh, I think we will go ahead and plan to answer those questions in a post-event blog. Uh, and I think since all of you are registered, um, you will be notified of the of the blog post. So um, I guess, uh, John Michael, uh, since you're our, our host today, any closing comments? No, thank you. Everything. I'm I'm really excited for all these thoughtful presentations. Uh, it's funny. There's already uh, Patrick's already getting articles out for the <laughs> uh, the product launches up on his website. This is awesome. So I I, I really enjoyed everybody's presentation. Uh, as you guys see, there actually is a lot more agreement on you know the future of SSD form factors than than previously thought. I know you know two to three years ago there was a lot of confusion about which one's going to win, what is everybody doing, and it looks like everybody was going in different directions. It seems like everybody. As you saw today, it's uh, it's kind of coming together, and uh, I'm so excited. To... <laughs> so, with that, um, uh, Ross, Cameron, do we have anything else? Was there? Um... Uh, probably once again, just uh, want to thank our event sponsors uh, for today: uh, Facebook, SK Hynix, Kyoxia, Intel, and SNIA. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Uh, for attending, uh, we'll we'll put this on the uh, OCP YouTube and the SNEA YouTube channel for everybody to view later. Uh, as Cameron said, if you guys have questions, just type them in. If we'll have a chance to go, uh, Cameron and I can write write up some answers on the on the blog for SNEA or whatnot or OCP uh, to get everything answered. But uh, again, thank you guys for and thank you all the presenters. Thank you so much for all the hard work on the presentations and slides to make this event uh, really great and. Uh, Sure, we got a lot of people excited about EDSBF and OCP and VMI SSDs. So, All right with that, Cameron, everybody, Ross, everybody. Uh, I know everybody's probably eager to go get to lunch and uh, <laughs> take a break. So, <laughs> I'll let everybody let everybody go. <laughs>